Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 126. Thanks so much for joining me on your Sunday morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Today's guest is Grant Quackenbush. He'll be here in about 15 minutes. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and we know you do too, so please do click on the like button and share and subscribe. Make sure you ring the bell for notifications. Whatever you can do to help it spread around the internet, please help us out by doing that. Now, we'd like to start with uh, Poets Respond and talk about today's poem. And um, today's poet was Avery Gregorich with There I Was. Let's give uh, Avery a call. Okay, let's see. Sorry. Hang on one second. So Skype made me uh, confirm that I couldn't use this for 911 calling. But let's see. Okay, here we go. Hey, Avery, this is Tim with Rattle. You are live on the air. How are you doing? Hi, Tim. Good morning. Uh, how's your uh, Sunday starting out so far? Uh, a bit of a rush getting the show started, but we're good to go now. So uh, so your poem today, There I Was, um, just an excellent look back at, um, at the event of last year, last January 6th. And one of the things that I love about you know being able to publish poems and what poetry can do is be a chronicle of the time. And I thought this poem just did such a great job of capturing, you know, the experience of that day from around the country, from wherever wherever you're located. Do you want to explain a little bit about why you wrote the poem and, and what was going on? Well, thanks for those kind of words. Well, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I would say uh, what I wanted to start with the poem was uh, this phrase, I was there, which is a phrase that really happened um, during this last uh, few days of remembrances. People were kind of um, speaking about where they were at the time. Um, and there was also the prol- proliferation afterward, the fact of people uh, posting on various social media accounts that they were there and being proud of that fact. And I kind of wanted to play with that phrase to start with. So that's, I kind of inverted that and wanted to go that direct, that direction. But um, yeah, so from there on, I, I had some words written down from last year. I never got around to sort of writing about it because I didn't have, have the, the words to say at the time, but um, thinking about uh, being in this, participatory uh the realm of the retail store where you're sort of waiting around for things to happen to you um made me want to kind of say where was i when this actually happened and uh, how did the event come to us here uh in the retail world uh, at least so that's kind of where the poem grew from oh that's really interesting i didn't realize that um that that was like a trending thing to say you know i was there and, and talk about that i hadn't heard that um yeah it, it just seemed to be like a you know on t-shirts and stuff and people were uh, you know saying I was there, you know, and they had, of course, they had pictures and videos of themselves there too. So um, I, I, I wanted to know what that was like for people to be proud of that moment. And then uh, even a year later, sort of feel that way too. I, I don't really understand that yet. So um, I'm not sure any of us do. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, not understanding is the perfect place to write a poem from, I think. It's interesting because I was, um, I, I felt very, even though I, I wasn't working in a grocery store that day, um, January sixth last year happened to be the day we go. I go grocery shopping in the morning, and um, sure. and so I was in a grocery store, and I knew this yeah. was going to be happening because I have you know I know I you know have heard about this, and for about a month ahead, people knew there was going to be a big protest going on, and um, and if um, you watch on like Twitch and some other platforms, you can see like tons of live streams all at once, and so I kind of rushed mm-hmm. home after the morning grocery shopping. Um, to catch what was, whatever was going on in the live streams. And I remember at first, nothing was going on. And I thought, oh, well, well this turned out to be a nothing. <laughs> and then little did I know, uh, about an hour right. later, it just turned into something. So um, Yeah, I usually, work, I usually work the second shift, so this would have been 2 or 3 o'clock, and I think that's when things really started happening. Uh, I don't know, officially or whatever you want to say. But uh, that's when I would say people started having their phones on them <laughs> as they were shopping, as they often do, but they were out, and uh, people were sort of... Uh, I don't know, looking at each other a little differently at that time. So, yeah, I definitely remember that for sure. Yeah. Well, why don't you go ahead and read it? This is uh, There I Was. Go ahead. Uh, There I was. There I was in the middle of the frozen food aisle by the breakfast items, putting something on the shelf behind the woman live streaming the insurrection on her phone. It was loud, and I saw her smile fight against the loops of the mask, chin strap beneath her teeth. She was watching the ones who had shown up in her place. The rest of us had to hear that sound and try to imagine the rest. I'd been watching the militia grow for months from my post behind the checkout counter, how quickly the uniforms were sewn. 
The stars and stripes had changed colors with the seasons until finally, in the winter, falling into darkness. It's bad out there, the nurse who worked at the grocery store to get cheaper in health insurance had said, though it wasn't clear what she was talking about. Shopping each aisle with care, she continued to tune in throughout the payment process. After she left, it got quiet again. Very few shopped the rest of the night, and those that did offered us cryptic updates, sometimes photos of smoke billowing, once a noose. I remember most of them buying canned goods. Driving home on the phone with my brother, he said, I never saw this coming. Did you? It's been so long now, hearing the bells ringing, that I believe I forgot what they used to mean. Yeah, and that was just a great last line. Can you say anything about, about where that last line came from? That was kind of the thing that sold the poem for me, was the, the, the leap you take there. Yeah, um, I, I just, I don't know. I, I want to say that it's, uh, I wanted to have something musical where we're all sort of listening to uh, the sound, but we can't agree on what, what the sound is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and for, for me, the bell is sort of a, a one note. Uh, each bell has its own note, so we're all sort of, hearing the same bell ringing, but we're all responding to it in such vastly different ways. Um, and I, I think I mentioned it in the note about living in several realities. And I really think that that's uh, unfortunately where, where we are at this current moment where we're not sure. I see it every day here at the store and uh, that's where I'm at right now. I'm talking to you on the telephone. Oh, in the really? parking lot. But uh, so, so yeah, I just, I, I've, I've noticed things change that way. And I, I, I feel like we're all getting the same, same bell ringing, but uh, we're all, listening in a different way, I guess, is kind of where I wanted to end up with that. Yeah, well, that was one of those great just poetic leaps. I think that captures it perfectly. And um, yeah. and, and so thanks for writing and sharing this poem. It's really excellent, Avery. I appreciate it, Tim. Uh, thanks for the time, and, and have a good rest of your, your broadcast. Yeah, take care. You too. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. Yeah, so that was uh, Avery Grigorich with There I Was. And let's go. We have a second poem this week, too. And this is on Zebulon Husset. The moon is covered in rabbits and trash. So let's talk to the second, uh, the second poet. There's going to be a Tuesday bonus poem coming up. So this is be previewed here on Poets Respond. Hello. Hey, Ziblon. This is uh, Tim with Rattle. You are live on the air. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what what this poem is about because it's an interesting story I hadn't heard, and I feel like. Um, it's sort of unusual um, at this point. Maybe it happened more often in the past where I don't know, I hadn't heard a story before it comes across the desk um, in the poetry response submissions. But this was one of those I was completely unaware of. Can you talk a little bit about what what inspired the poem? Yeah, the um, you know, I was taken by, um, it was quite a few years back in uh, like 2014 when the first Jade Rabbit rover, um, the Chinese rover, was going around the moon and it had like a social media account. Um, and they were putting out all kinds of like cutesy messages about like what it was seeing and what it was uh, going to do. And then it started failing and it's, you know, it wasn't sure it went offline for a while. Um, and then it had that really, you know, funny, funnily sad message um, about how it was actually, it was going to be going out of commission. And because it had been, you know, personified so much, it was, it was actually pretty sad. And there was like kind of an outpouring press social media um, in um, sympathy for that, for the rover, the little robot. Um, so I had that in the back of my mind, um, along with the uh, just the fact that there apparently there is a whole lot of garbage on the moon because it costs so much to take things back mm-hmm. from the moon that they end up just leaving a lot of stuff there. Um, there's actually a proposed uh, project to go and do a little bit of cleanup sometime in the near future. Um, but then uh, just recently, the, the new rover um, had seen a little square on the on the horizon of uh, one of its images. And people would speculate, oh, it's it's very square. You know, it's unusually square. Um, and of course, most people were, you know, rational about it. It's like, well, it's a low resolution camera. So, you know, it's probably not actually mm-hmm. square. It's just something sticking above the horizon a little bit. Um, but because the rover takes so long to move up there, um, it was like two weeks, I think, from the first sighting until it actually got there. Um, so there was a lot of time for speculation and a lot of sensationalist news, little, you know, um, news stories, especially on websites, um, talking about it. And so I was kind of keeping my eye out to see, you know, hey, maybe, maybe it's something, it's probably nothing. Um, but then, of course, it, you know, it ended up being nothing, but... <laughs> <laughs> as most things are, but it's always fun to, you know, speculate and to be curious about things. Um, 
And then, yeah, and they, I thought it was in, it was really funny that they also they named that also Jade Rabbit. So we had you know three Jade Rabbits on the moon. Uh huh. Yeah, just really interesting story. And I'm sure uh, somewhere, what's that guy? Richard C. Hoagland was having a field day over uh, over you know, the face on the Mars guy. But I somehow I missed all this. Which was a really fun. Uh, you know, it's it's there's so few stories these days that are fun. And you know, speculating yeah. about uh, uh, Moon Hut is a, is a fun story, <laughs> um, even though it, you know it goes into um, you know all the garbage and 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 how we can't even keep the moon clean. Um, <laughs> but uh, why don't you go ahead and read and read the poem? Okay, certainly. So uh, it's called "The Moon Is Covered in Rabbits and Trash." This time, it really is good night. There are still so many questions I would like answers to but I'm the rabbit that has seen the most stars. The moon has prepared a long dream for me. I don't know what it will be like. Will I be a Mars explorer or be sent back to Earth? You two, moon rover, February 2014. For weeks, we had an intriguing mystery, a perfect cube popping over the horizon of the moon. A moon hut, they called it. They, not being nerds, a.k.a. scientists, but the cool kids publishing their words on websites world round. And we all knew it was clickbait. It was wishful thinking. Not even propaganda, like a waving flag where there's no wind, but there actually is the reverberations of a pole jostled as it was propped up by a man in a bulky suit. We knew, knew it was just a rock. Spoiler, it was. But that didn't stop us from clicking and providing sweet, sweet ad revenue and our personal browsing history via cookies embedded in our computers. Our super secret spy on the moon was U-2-2, younger brother of the original Jade Rabbit rover, U-2, social media sensation and part-time Chinese moon rover that enthralled us with its cute messages, which were totally not just an advertising agency putting an adorable face on its usually bland scientific announcements until we were unknowingly hooked and then heartbroken when it finally faltered and we marveled as the stargazing bunny gave us a tear-filled goodbye. Its successor spied the hut and again enthralled us all. Now, no one posited it was one of the six lunar modules NASA landed or crashed and left on the moon's surface. Those monuments, trash, were well plotted, and in some cases, surrounded by bags of frozen urine and feces and packaging too costly to retrieve from the moon not to mention all of the machinery that died or was abandoned like the aforementioned Jade Rabbit. So when the second Jade Rabbit slow rolled its way closer to the hut, it was, surprise, surprise, a rock. Oblong, not quite round, and not even enormous, just big enough to blip the lip of a crater enough for the low-resolution camera to pixelate it. It was also dubbed Jade Rabbit because why not? We have enough unnamed rocks. Yeah, thanks so much for that. That was uh, the moon is covered in rabbits and trash, and and um, Zebulon, you have um, a lot of projects going on. We mentioned, and one of them is a new literary journal. Do you want to mention that um, Coastal Shelf? Do you want to explain just while you're here, because um, you know our viewers are always listening, looking for new places to submit. Do you want to talk a little bit about your journal? Certainly. Um, yeah, Coastal Shelf is a journal. It's, I started it um, in 2020. Um, well, I started accepting submi- uh, submissions in 2020, and I had my first issue at the end of it. Um, and then we're just about to do um, our sixth issue is going live later in this month, as well as a little um, one calling an annual, um, because I'm doing them quarterly. But then also um, we've gotten so many great pieces that it was hard to um, to say no to, to quite a few of them. So, but we only had so much space because I determined I didn't want anything to get lost. So I, I set kind of a, a pretty rigid limit on how many pieces per quarterly issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, so but unfortunately, also when I started the journal, I had a lot more free time. I was uh, working as a freelance photographer at the time. And so I uh, wanted to give feedback to as many people as possible. Um, and that um, was, was great at first. Um, but then this <laughs> last year, I got a job as a uh, ninth grade English teacher. Mm-hmm. And so I, had to mo- I moved across the country in less than a month and got set up. I was in an extended stay hotel for actually like uh, three months almost at the beginning, trying to find a place to live. 
Um, and we finally got into a place, but because of all of this, it's really kind of put us a little behind on the reading. Um, we were intending to open up for submissions again in January, but we're pushing that back to March. Mm -hmm. So that way we can get caught up because I have a, a very small staff of volunteers. Um, and we also read, um, uh, free submissions. So uh, we, oh, we, great, yeah. uh, yeah, both for our, our journal and also we had uh, two contests this mm -hmm. last summer um, and we accepted free submissions as well as uh, small paid submissions. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in our, all of those prize winners are in our fifth issue. We're going to be doing that again in April. Um, and hopefully to facilitate that, we're doing our first little um, online workshop for a, a small fee that we hopefully can help um, you know pay for the, prize, the prizes because I really want – as many people as possible to be able to submit. And I know that the, from personal experience, especially soon after grad school, that um, having submission fees can, can really stop a lot of people from getting the work out there. So we want to do that as much as possible, and, you know, try to get as many people um, involved as we can. Yeah, that is really cool. I mean, the, the barrier that submission fees make, you know, economically, they really add up, you know, which is why um, it's really important to have at least some places that don't have submission fees so that they can be open to everybody. Um, is there anything about the editorial vision of um, Coastal Shelf that you can share? Like, is, what are you, kind of poems are you looking for? You know, we really like um, poems that have something to say that um, – the, they have something that you can come away from the poem and think about that you can remember. Um, we call it um, like the, like the, it has to have, uh, we don't, we don't like put it when, when we give our feedback, of course we don't use these terms, but the kind of the, uh, so what am I remembering from this sort of uh, factor? Um, what is it that the poet is saying? Um, and then also our contest, we, it was called the Fupo poetry contest, the funny and poignant. Uh -huh. And we, that kind of extends uh, through through our vision in general. I mean, obviously, not not everything has to be funny, but it should ideally either be one or the other, and it shouldn't. We try to avoid anything too like uh, too light. Mm -hmm. well, and we do. Good, yeah. uh, oh, sorry. oh no, yeah. I was just gonna keep keep going. What were you saying? Oh, I was just saying we we do fiction as well. Ah, okay. We tend to lean towards shorter pieces, but this um, new issue that we're working on actually has two pieces that are over five thousand words. So. As a, a departure, and the other contest we do is actually we uh, the first feeling two hundred, which was two hundred words or less, um, mm -hmm. and this year we're doing two hundred and fifty. We get oh. a little bit more room. Mm -hmm. Well, very cool. Well, thanks so much for joining us and for sharing this. Um, it's coastalshelf dot com for anybody who wants to check out issues one through five and uh, submit some poems when they open up again. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and for sharing this great Thank poem too. Well. I really loved it. Oh, thanks so much. And if you don't mind, I also I run one other small journal that um, I actually uh, it's only for pieces that are sparked by um, uh, writing prompts that are online at oh. uh, uh -huh. various uh, sites online that publish writing prompts. That's called Sparks a Literary Magazine. Uh, what's the URL? Um, what's the URL, URL for that? Uh, that's SparkedLitMag.com. dot com. Okay, Sparked Lit Mag. That yeah, one okay. Works. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that one we're working on. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, because of my time restrictions, it was monthly, but now it's gone to quarterly. So we have our winter issue that's going to be coming out in the next uh, about a month from now. Yeah, very cool. So this is a. I mean, we have a prompt at the end of every episode. So um, when submissions are open, there, you could submit uh, your prompt poems to Sparked. I assume, right? Hundred percent. We've actually published a couple of Rattlecast poems, as well as uh, quite a few um, ekphrastic, uh, ekphrastic challenge ones, pe ones that were originally written for you guys. And then, um, because you know, obviously, such limited space and so many people writing poems, I, I like the idea of having um, additional homes for pieces that are sparked for a specific cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, very cool. I hope everybody checks out both of these. What is uh, sparked? Sparked like past tense. Sparked litmag dot com. Yeah. But yeah, thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much. Yep, have a great day. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, so that was uh that was Zebulon Husset with um The Moon is Covered in Rabbits and Trash. A great title too, in addition to a very interesting poem. Now we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna go to today's featured guest, Grant Quackenbush. So I will uh put up some music and we will be right back.
And we're back, but we're having some technical difficulties, so bear with us a little bit. Let me, uh, you know, Grant's got uh, some feedback issue going on that we can't uh, figure out that wasn't in the test call. So he's really echoey. So he's going to try to figure that out. We're going to go back to him probably about 10 minutes from now. But let's, in the meantime, um, let's do a random poem. Um, this is, uh, I just pushed the random button, and we came up with a February, well, that's too recently. That was just last year. Let's do a more, an older random button poem. Oh, that was a popular one with, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, here's an older one. This is uh, February 13th, 2010, from medal number 31. This is Ian Williams, Hero. There's a poem uh, from the uh, tribute to African-American poets that we did in that issue. Let's give this a play while we uh, see if we can... Hero. The hero wins, because that's what heroes do when you spend the money to buy the DVD of a movie you already know the ending to. Not because you've seen it before, but because you heard from a colleague in HR that it would make you feel real good after. It was the best thing she's seen lately, and that's with her being married, and every morning pushing spoons into the faces of her two children. So you watch it, knowing the only thing that will make you feel good this evening is seeing a bare-chested man wail on another in a ring and another in a street and another in a ring in slow-mo and the doof-doof sounds of the gloves striking bodies in movies which don't sound like bodies for real. Not that you'd admit to knowing that. And the hero doesn't even look like heroes in the real world, which are not the heroes in grade four essays either. But like, stay with me. This one time, you dropped by a woman's place, and you were sitting at her kitchen table, and she asked you if you wanted anything to drink, and she opened the fridge, and you saw through the crack between her body and the door only a pitcher of water on the wire shelf in the yellow light. You want to call her a hero because she's surviving with her mouth shut, or yourself, because you're so affected, must mean you're noble. Go ahead, but there are other words for you too. And that was a poem from uh, round number 31 by Ian Williams, Hero. And I'm not sure. So so if you, uh, we're still trying to get in touch with Grant, um, and um, we'll see if uh, maybe we'll do another poem. I want to give him enough time to get try to get that thing settled out. So let's uh, let's try another another poem. Here is um, man. Every time I push the random button, it keeps being uh, poems from just this year. I want to go back farther in time. Here we go to another longer poem. This is Parthos Serrano with "Love of Distance," and this was from rattle number twenty-seven. So um, yeah, I'll read her note, too. I probably should have read the last note. This is uh, Prather Serrano's note. When I first read that so much depended on a red wheelbarrow beside the white chickens, I breathed a sigh of relief. My inner whisperer seemed to know this kind of thing, but I had always felt her murmurings to be of no use. Now I could scramble through an odd labyrinth, labyrinth of life hoops. Psychologist, cab driver, head cook, single parent, house cleaner, palmist, phys ed teacher, poet in the schools, but with someone I could trust inside. She's the one who writes my poems. So it's a great note by Prather Serrano. And here's her poem, Love of Distance, from rattle number 27. He's enchanted with the idea of reaching through space, wants me to wait by the window while he climbs the far-off mountain, sets up the light, flashes something back in Morse code, he says we should begin studying our dots and dashes, along with smoke signals, the extravagantly long rolled R's of Spanish, hand gestures of the deaf. Or we could take the rim trail, one of us staying on the southern lip, while the other heads north till our bodies shrink to the size of tree frogs. Then we can converse across the canyon without effort, no need to raise our voices. 
He is certain this will work, that the atmosphere at these heights will bear our words with a clarity as yet unknown to us. My faith in these things is weaker. I dare not tell him the far eastern stories, the one where the poet builds two houses on opposite shores of the lake, gives one to his sweetheart, who he tells to go in, take up dulcimer or needlework, learn to love the lonely ways. Think of the surprise, he says, one of our faces suddenly shining between the black birds and reeds. And that was uh, Love of Distance by Prarthos Sereno from medal number 27. Um, let's see. So the, uh, good stuff here. And we'll try to get Grant back. Let's try, I'm going to go back to break again. We'll see if we can get Grant this time, okay? So let's do that.
And we're back. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. A little extra. We had some technical difficulties. I'm not sure, as I was flipping through mutes and, and, and trying to fix different things, that how much you heard about my explanation for what was going on. But we were trying to get a... We had an echo going that we couldn't figure out, which we finally did. So um, we're back, and let's get with Grant Quackenbush. Grant Quackenbush grew up skateboarding in San Diego. He received his MFA from Boston University and his BA from the University of California, Santa Cruz. His poems have appeared in Rattle Number 69, 73, and The Ekphrastic Challenge. And his first book, Off Topic, was just published by, um, um, by um, Pinion, Pinion Publishing, is the name of the publisher. Um, you can find it at pinion-publishing.com. But here he is, finally, <laughs> Grant Quackenbush. Hey, Grant, how you doing? Doing well. Oh my goodness. What a, uh, what a start. It was so good last night when we did the test run, but oh well. Yeah. So that, that I, I learned, um, you know, we figured out what happened, which was that we had, and it might be because I switched to using the meat version a few, you know, a few, uh, a few episodes back and somehow that let you be logged in twice on the same call. It was weird, but anyway, we got it all settled. And, um, I'm so glad to have you as a guest today. Um, a really interesting book here off topic. Do you want to start out by reading a poem? Sure. Yeah. And uh, I was going to actually ask you last night, but I forgot to do it. Uh, it's a little bit of a flex, but I was going to say that uh, Opinion Publishing nominated Off Topic for a, a CLMP Firecracker Award, if you're ah, familiar cool. with that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I'm, pr I'm pretty stoked about that. Oh, uh, cool. Whether it will that. be a finalist or not, probably not. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I'll start off with Houseplant. Um, okay. It's actually the first poem in the book. Okay. Here it is, Houseplant. I water my ficus with milk. It grows a mouth, sharp teeth. It yells at me. Asshole, it shouts. Put some miracle growing here. Put me in a bigger pot. I do and give it more milk. I feed it meatloaf, bacon, porterhouse steak. Its roots branch out the bottom and break into legs, two twigs into muscular arms. It sprouts a monstrous cock. Hikes its pot up like a soiled diaper, smokes bud, walks around, does finger push-ups on the ground. It opens my wallet, removes a 20, dons my leather jacket. When I rush to stop it, it shoves me. Kick his ass, my wife says to the ficus. She laughs, spreads her legs, says come here with her middle finger. The ficus grins. It enters the bedroom. It plants in her its seed. Uh, <laughs> it was a little bit awkward reading that because my... Go. niece is like 12 years old and just was walking through the room just now oh really yeah but i couldn't stop mid poem um yeah we had uh we used to do readings at the uh at the bookstore and there was a children's section like not too far away and forever there was no you know after hundreds of of readings there was never a problem but then there was one poem where there was like somebody shouting in a fight on the subway and i, I won't even say what was said but the poem required <laughs> the poet to be shouting you know profanities and um yeah you know, so that happens sometimes and, the, and then that was a bad situation so it happens with poetry sometimes um so so the thing that um is really interesting your your um your poem that we published which appeared on rattle last week um was about it claims to be the last poem you ever write and um i don't know if that's going to so be far. true or not so so no. uh, let's start out before we get into that maybe um how did you get into publishing and and I think this is like a, a story of like disillusionment or something, but why did you get into poetry and, and is it really the last poem you'll ever write? Disillusionment's an interesting word. Before I answer that, what do you mean by that? You mean my story is a story of disillusionment, like the story of off topic? Yeah, I think so. It feels kind of like that. Like, um, um, or at least the, you know, the, the conclusion of that, the alphabet city sequence. Um, yeah. You know, so, so what was it, you know, what was it that got you into writing poetry in the first place? Let's start there and then we'll talk about the, the journey. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I majored in philosophy, graduated when I was 23 and I uh, couldn't get a job after I was bicycling 10 miles to work, 10 miles back, barely making any money, 10 bucks an hour, um, maybe less at the time. And, um, it was just such a grind, uh, uh, to avoid paying back student loans. I ended up going to this, uh, master's program that I couldn't stand. It was for, uh, TESOL actually, uh, which stands for teaching English to speakers of other languages. Um, I really just did it to avoid the, um, situation I was in at the time. I was like sleeping on the floor in the living room. It was pretty crappy. Um, but I, I quit 
after a semester, came back and um, to basically to avoid paying back student loans, I took a uh, junior college, a couple of junior college classes. You have to take six credits. You have to be half time. Uh, one of them was creative writing. I just picked the easiest thing I thought, you know, um, or the thing I thought would be easiest. Uh, but, um, you know, of course, I was already naturally inclined to reading and writing through philosophy. Mm -hmm. And when it came time to do the poetry portion of the class, I gradu um, gravitated naturally toward toward that strongly. Um, it was no question in my mind that that's what um, I now thought I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I was filled with purpose and hope and all these things, which I talk about in my uh, double absidarium, uh, a brief history of my life, zero to 30. Um, I talk briefly about that. Um, and then, so my teacher told me about it, MF, uh, the existence of MFA programs and how you could go for free um, and get paid to write poetry. And I was like, what? This exists? No way. And so um, I applied that fall after having written poetry for like a month. And of course, got rejected everywhere. Uh, the next year I reapplied. Um, I kept taking literature classes. I tech kept taking creative writing classes like obsessively writing obsessively for the next year and got in everywhere I applied to. Hmm. Um, but I ended up choosing, sorry, this is long. Should I keep going? No. Yeah. Go, yeah. Tell the story. Okay. This is a story. Um, uh, I ultimately narrowed it down to university of Oregon, Boston university and UC Irvine. I chose UC Irvine because it was close to where I lived in San Diego I was just an hour up the coast. I, I had never been to the East Coast or anything like that. So, and they were, um, it was actually the first MFA program I'd ever heard of, probably because I lived in SoCal. Um, and so to me, it was like, wow, I have to go to UC Irvine. Michael Ryan and Amy Gerstler taught there, um, who, were, who were poets I had read. Um, and then I'll fast forward kind of quickly through the rest. Basically, I ended up dropping out of UC Irvine. They didn't like that program. And this was during the uh, you know, Trump election and stuff like that. So and we could talk more about that. And it was a very uh, volatile atmosphere. It wasn't, uh, didn't really, felt like I couldn't write what I wanted to write. So, uh, and there were some very woke people that I just really couldn't stand in the program. So, Dropped out. I thought I would never go back to an MFA program again. Ended up moving to the East Coast um, by chance uh, to New York City. Uh, when I was there, I figured I would reapply to MFA programs, to Boston University specifically. Got in, went, loved it. Great experience at Boston. And uh, worked on my manuscript a couple of years or another year after that. Published. Here we are. So... That's sort of like the chronological timeline, but of course, uh, my thoughts um, toward poetry uh, changed a lot during that time. Mm -hmm. Well, just the the state of poetry has changed a lot in that time span. Yeah, when when so was much. this that you started? Like what year? Boston. Yeah, the first time when you um, when you your oh philosophy, started you know, poetry. Yeah, Two th uh, fall two thousand thirteen. I started writing poetry, mm -hmm. and uh, in fact, the oldest poem in the book, Auto Stereogram, I began. In the fall of 2000, in fall 2013. So that's the oldest one in the book. So, so you know, the, the poem that we were talking about was it claims to be the last poem you'll ever write. Um, is, so is far, that, yeah. It has that been the last poem you haven't written a poem since? I've tried to write one mm -hmm. since then, um, and I stopped on purpose. Um, I love poetry. I, I love poetry. I love reading poetry. I love writing poetry. But to write poetry right now is honestly, it's uh, it, it's just irresponsible. Like I'm, I'm in a hard place in life right now, uh, financially, circumstantially. It, it would just honestly be irresponsible for me to write right now. It, it's not like in um, uh, olden times, like Dostoevsky cranked out a novel in order to earn a living. You can't do that anymore. You can't earn a living off your writing. So I have to just stop and try to get my finances in order. Perhaps someday I'll write again. It's, a, it's something I think about every single day. So you're right in asking that question because um, it's something I struggle with. It's almost like an addiction. And it's like to give up that addiction is, is difficult. You want to always go back to it. Um, and 
Yeah. <laughs> Well, I Maybe. mean, I, I want to say yes yeah. for sure. It's the last poem I'll ever write because fuck poetry. But um, in the in the issue I was published in the last poem I'll ever write, um, the Indian Poets issue, um, someone wrote in their biography in the back, um, if you could quit writing, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you remember reading that, but uh -huh. yeah. um, and that was that's all they said. And um, I thought, yeah, I mean, if you can quit, do it because it doesn't make sense from a materialistic or worldly standpoint or anything like that, or from a fame standpoint, no one gives a shit. Um, women certainly don't give a shit. <laughs> um, but but, this book. Okay. but you're, you're a philosophy major, right? And, and yeah, there's more to life than the material world. And, and poetry oh. is enriching and I mean, there, there, there's reasons why you said you said you love poetry. I mean, what are the things that you yeah, love about it? I love that it, um, by the way, I have not picked up a philosophy book since grad, since graduating. So I've, I, I've done away with philosophy, but which I don't think helps the world or oneself. Uh, I know it sounds super cynical, but, um, I love that poetry creates in me a very calm meditative state. Mm -hmm. Um, my brain can be very haywire and poetry centers me. It's awesome. Um, I just, I also just, I just love putting together a good sentence. It's there's just something very pleasing about that. Um, and making it perfect. And um, kind of like just looking back, reading it, reading it through over and over and over again and being like, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Um, it feels good. I don't know. It's maybe what a, a construction worker feels when they build a house or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, to compare it to something non-artistic. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the yeah. one thing I can compare it to is um, one summer I worked landscaping, and we did a lot of these. Like, there was a, it was a, um, a, a company that that turned regular houses into group homes. They were like foreclosed houses. We would turn them into group homes for mentally ill adults, and so they would be like a mess. And then you would work all week on like the yard fixing it all up, and then you know, there'd be like flower beds and there'd be rings around the trees and the grass would be cut. And there was this like sense that you did something and that you, you yeah. made something and they made the world a little bit better in this tiny, tiny way. And that's For the sure. feeling I get when I, when there's a good poem, you know, yeah. it's that feeling of completion and like betterment and making some kind of order out of the chaos of the world. And, and I just think that's always worth doing, even if there's no financial reward for it. Um, I know. I agree. And that's, that's a struggle. That's, that's kind of the struggle. But then I'm like, well, damn, I might be sleeping in some bushes next week. So like, I'm not even kidding. So it's like, what do I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think if I were to return to writing, I would have to have, I would have to be at a place of abundance, uh, emotionally, especially financially, um, because, uh, this idea of the starving artist is a bunch of bullshit. Um, it, you write much better in a home with yeah. warmth, with food in your stomach, <laughs> not scrapping out an existence, you know, on pen and paper, going to the public library to submit your work. Mm -hmm. No, that's crap. Um, so I think uh, my, one of my favorite poets, Frederick Seidel, who I, who um, a quote from his poem is the epigraph of this book. Uh, from his poem, Widening Income Inequality. And I chose that on purpose. It's a book about socioeconomics. The poem specifically is about socioeconomics. Um, he published his first book and didn't start writing again for almost 20 years. Uh, sometimes you just need to figure stuff out and he didn't figure it out. It took him 20 years to realize, you know what, I got to keep writing. Mm -hmm. But I think that might be me. We'll see. Time will tell. Well, here's this uh, quote from Frederick... Um... Frederick Seidel, open your arms like a fresh pack of cards and shuffle the deck. Now open your heart. Now open your art. Now get down on your knees in the street and eat. That's, uh, that's it. the epigram from the book, yeah. Um, let's hear another poem. Uh, what do you want to read next? Uh, I'll do 81 and over. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, because I think it's unique. Uh, and then I'll go into a double lap starings after that. Uh, 81 over. It begins with a epigraph by Denise Duhamel, which you've had on the Rattlecast. I actually didn't listen to that Rattlecast. But, um, so she says in her poem, 
and my strip club the girls crawl on stage wearing overalls and turtlenecks then slowly pull on gloves ski masks and hiking boots at herb's strip club the girls are grannies with diabetes they get wheeled out onto a carpeted stage by come hither caregivers who change their diapers take it off the old men in the crowd shout in coarse voices scratched by age they reach into beige khakis, toss handfuls of butterscotch candies like gold coins into a fountain of youth. They drink warm milk. Today, one of the boys died from sudden cardiac arrest, electrified by his eyes. No one seems to notice the team of paramedics carting off the carcass like a football player in a stretcher as the wonderful lethal Ethel went around pinching cheeks, swinging her pendulous breasts like a clock. And that was 81 and over from Off Topic. Yeah. And you can see already, um, looking at these poems, what the title kind of means, Off Topic. Um, yeah. You know, these are poems that are that are irreverent and sort of try to push the boundaries of things. And and do you think it's your, I mean, what is it that, that drove you to write, to want to be going off topic? Let's put it that way. So uh, one of my favorite poets is this... Uh, poet you probably never heard of but her name is Sarah Scro and she is um she's around my age a little bit younger um but um I have corresponded with her before I've been in a journal with her um and she writes really um uh off the cuff poetry really daring poetry kind of grotesque poetry and she was interviewed once and she said in the interview there is this tendency in poetry for you to produce a book that is like unilateral that like uh that that like showcases one dimension of a person like um oh this person's lived experience is as a mexican immigrant and the book therefore is about mexican immigrants like um and i'm mexican by the way so i use that example but um well, it could be anything, though, but like there it's so unidimensional, often uh, a, a complete books of poetry. And she said that there's so many layers to a human being. There's happiness. There's sad. There's well, we're constantly changing our opinions. Heck, next week I could be like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to start writing another book of poetry. And so my goal was always just to write the best poem I could ever possibly write. And whatever I had at the end of that, just put it together in as organized a fashion as possible, of course. But um and it ended up being in three parts the first part being i feel like hyper energetic uh very off topic poetry the second part being sort of somber morose melancholic poetry which i liken to picasso's blue period i always think about that and the last poem being the only form poems in the book which are alphabet poems but um i really always remember what uh that and she said it a lot better than i did but um why do we have to um, create a book of poetry that is co oh cohesive is a word like cohe like in terms of our personality and stuff? Uh, why not just create a bunch of random really good poems? Um, so I think people used to do that too. Maybe like Ted Kuzer comes to mind, just like poems that aren't uh, necess aren't really about anything except just good poems, mm -hmm. <laughs> just like good good poems with good metaphors. Yeah, um, and, and I think part of that is the professionalization of poetry, which um, you know Dana Joy, who we've had on the Rattlecast too, has that that um, essay that he wrote way back in like 1995 or something about what the you know MFA program situation does to make this sort of class of poets that have institutional support and and sort of this whole thing that grows out of it. Um, and, and the so the cohesiveness of books tends to be the contest model. I mean, you know, poem, you know, books of poems stand out when when they have some kind of thing that you can remember them by. And so, books with themes and, and that are cohesive like that work better in the contest model, which is what part of the you know the professionalization mm -hmm. of literature itself. And so, um, so it's sort of interesting that that to hear you being pushed toward that because it seems like what you're, the, the, what the book. I mean, talking about a cohesive theme, mm -hmm. even if you didn't intend it, the book feels to me like a sort of a gradual, um, like the like the journey of a poet coming into awareness of that institutionalization aspect. Like there's kind of this like yeah. 
the beginning section is like, wow, I can write about anything and I'm the, yes. the creative juices are flowing. And then yes. it's like, oh, but I'm not fitting in. Now this sucks. <laughs> and, you know, yes. that's kind of the journey totally. of the book. And um, totally. so, so, and so it's always, I feel like it's my role to try to, to maintain the, the, passion and spontaneity of the first section of the book for i mean that's kind of what i always hope to do uh with rattle is to have a lot of variety and be surprising every time we publish something and and not go sort of go along with any kind of um like establishment structure and oh. and it's always a challenge because you're you know i mean we are sort of the black sheep of the poetry world too i mean we Darn. um we, uh, you know, we're, we have the most subscribers, but we're hardly ever in best American poetry. We're actually blacklisted from places, uh, you know. So it's, uh, you know, for you some of the poets we've published. Poetry. Sorry, what? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. You know, just for some of the poets we've published. I mean, other people won't talk to me, and um, and it's just a weird, it's a weird world that we're living in. Um, so do, can you talk a little about that? Like, what was your like, what was the, was there a moment that you realized sort of you didn't fit in? This is the thing that I worry about. I guess what yeah. I love about poetry is that you get to step in so many different shoes. I love like not agreeing with a poet, not having, you know, not having that experience at all and then getting to live that and see the world through those eyes. And so what I always worry about is as we get more professional is you know, is there's like more just more um just more uh... I don't know, you know, the awards and everything how everything works, how the publishing works. As we get more <laughs> sort of cohesive um, you sort of lose the fringe people that are the most interesting because they're sort of pushed away. And, and that's the thing that always bothers mm -hmm. me. So was there a moment that mm -hmm. you felt like you recognized that you didn't fit in? Yeah, with 81 and over, actually. That's one of the reasons I wanted to read it because um, I hope it does cause people to go, ooh, that's a little uncomfortable. Uh, but I, I remember bringing that poem into a workshop and someone said... <laughs> It was ageist that I hate old people. <laughs> I just remember thinking, like, oh my God, wow. Like this that was the first time I'd I'd ever experienced like someone calling my poem like ist, you know, like racist or ageist or something like that. And um it was a shocker. And that poem or that person continued to uh critique my poems in that type of way. Um which again led me to drop out. I was just like, oh, I can't, I can't do this. Like, I can't write my poetry the way I want to write it. That, yeah, UC Irvine was was as a whole was uh, when I realized I didn't fit in, and other people realized that too. I have a good friend, Michael Gould. He's been published in uh, places like the Adroit Journal, MSC, like good places, um, and he's like, he's just a straight white male. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he's having a hard time getting published and he eventually quit um, because at one point, one of the people in the um, uh, program uh, went around just, I don't know if you, if you wanna hear this story, but um, it's a pretty kind of powerful story. I feel like there was like these poetry presentations or whatever, and there was a, a, a power, whatever it's called. Um, anyways. Um, and he just went around the room saying, fuck you to every white person. He said, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you to every white person in the room. And, and then ended by saying, fuck you, white people. And then after that, gave his uh, presentation on like historical poetry or something like that. And uh, we were just like, what the fuck? Um, I mean, yeah, that that's that was the atmosphere in 2016 at UC Irvine. And uh, it was disgusting and not conducive to creating art. Um, and I almost thought I would quit writing poetry then, but I continued. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm glad I continued to have produced Well, you this said book. your experience at um, Boston University was much better, though. And, and, yeah. And, um, so, I mean, maybe diff different places or just have different feels. One of the things yeah, that's always difficult out. is that um, publishing is such a black box. You know, you, you sort of put your thing in and then you get a response back and you have no idea what's gone on behind the scenes, which makes you wonder... Um, you know, if there's other things besides the poems that are that are being you know used to decide um, what's being published, and there's really no way around that problem because you can't, uh, you, you just can't know, and so it's really easy to jump to conclusions about that. But the truth is that publishing is just really hard. There's so many poets, which is another thing about the professionalization. That's the point that Dana Joya makes: is that there's thousands of um, poets graduating from university programs every 
year and yeah. um, you know it's certified yeah. as poets and, and all need to be published and then there's that's the publish yeah is masters of poetry and then there's the publish your parish <laughs> model for the jobs they're trying to seek um so you have to keep publishing no matter what and so there's the, really um you know it, it'd be, be, it's weird because we talk about you know there's no money in poetry um, but still capitalists yeah. like market forces push poetry in all the directions that it goes in and um, and that's one of them the, the, mm-hmm. the just the um the the environment of having to publish um and just having so many people trying to publish and so many poets it's sort of a i don't know it's like a it's the best of times and the worst of times in a weird way there's the best poetry you've ever seen and um and 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 it's also the the more hard more difficult to to be published or so it's it's a it's a tough time it's a strange time um yeah i can talk really quick about, about yeah. that um dickens i don't like dickens but <laughs> anyways um, that was the Dickens quote, right? But um, uh, yeah, I remember reading on some guys like Twitter feed. I don't have Twitter, but maybe it was on Twitter. Maybe it was on Facebook or something. Uh, Kava Akbar, you probably heard of him, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, big big time poet, whatever. Um, he wrote, it is a golden age of poetry. It is a golden age of poetry. It is a golden age of poetry. Sometime, I don't know, 2017 or something like that. And I just thought, yeah, for you. <laughs> I mean, for you. Uh, for people uh, who have been handed awards and uh, given prestigious teaching pres- uh, positions at Purdue University and who fit all the woke criteria, you know, as a Middle Eastern guy who uh, is non-binary and all these things. Yeah, for you, it's a golden age of poetry. For me, just some uh, straight white guy writing poetry that is mildly offensive to people, uh it's not at all. I'm trying to write the best, or I was trying to write the best poetry I possibly could. I thought that's all that mattered, right? Well, that's not all that matters at all. In fact, that's very little of what matters, uh, at least in my experience. And it's unfortunate. Um, it is a golden age of poetry. Oh my God, give me a break. Well, um, I, I think that it is. I mean, there, you know, there's. I hope. I, I mean, right, it, exclusion was a huge problem for 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 a very long time, for, for a century, you know, and the fact that everybody has more access to it and there's just so many poets writing and there's so many opportunities. I mean, there's so many much competition to publish, but there's so many opportunities to publish too. I mean, back in even the seventies, people had to make their own magazines because there weren't magazines and there weren't creative writing programs to go to. And, um, I think it really is the golden age actually. And, um, I think it's easy to sort of, you know, see how hard it is to, to get a hold of anything, but um, but it's also it's also there's so many opportunities for everybody, and I think it I think it really is the best time. Um, but poetry does exist outside of um, a profit, which is sort of the beauty. You sort of have to embrace that because there's no there's no way to commodify it, and there's no um, yeah you know, there's no way to make money, which which is sort of the purity in the the beauty of it. So I, I really do think it's the the golden age of poetry. I don't because when there's so much of something, uh, it becomes devalued. Like you're seeing this with the with inflation right now, the American dollar. When there's so much money printed, dollar becomes devalued. No one gives a shit about it. Um, and so when there's so much poet, so much poetry, uh, and a really good poem, like every poem and off topic, of course, uh, can get passed over uh, easily because someone in some MFA program at Antioch University or something like that, it's just like, oh, this, whatever, whatever, whatever. Because uh, a lot of uh, young readers are reading the poems um, uh, for submissions. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, to go back to Dostoevsky, uh, the reference, I'd rather live during that time, you know, mm-hmm. to create great art, put forth that great art, and people would be more likely to see it mm-hmm. am i that's my view and i also just don't like the whole technological like online era where you can just uh look up poetry for free and not buy the book and stuff like that i don't really like that yeah well there's something about holding a book in your hands that's so much better than um than having a book on a screen on your phone where it's all a distraction um yeah no l- l- it's so it. antithetical to poetry i feel like yeah um yeah I'm just trying to read. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, Malcolm Glass says, so many poets, 1941, a woman says to Frost, 
how wonderful that 600 poets were published in journals last month. And then Frost replies, Madame, there haven't been 600 poets in the history of the English language. And I mean, that was the case back then. And now there are, there are 600 poets with degrees this semester that just graduated. And, um, and I think, I don't know, I think the, I think the quality though rises to the top. Like I, like you, you know, if you say, you know, I'm working hard and writing great poems, you had poems published in Rattle, you had your book published. It was nominated for a firecracker award. Um, I mean, all works. you know, so it's not, it's not like it doesn't work. I mean, I think it does. Yeah. There's just a lot of, of competition and there are a lot of poems out there. There's, there's a lot of things distracting us and drawing our attention elsewhere. Um, but, but I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I try to, I wanted to, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is to persuade you not to quit. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. And so I just be upfront <laughs> about that because, because I think that we need a variety of voices um, and perspectives. And, and I, and I really worry about people being, you know, being scared away and, and then not continuing. Um, and, and, and so, um, I don't know. So I hope that you continue writing. Do you want to read another poem? Sure. Yeah. And really quickly though, it, before anyone thinks I'm complaining and like, Oh, white male privilege, right? Oh my God. Or white male fragility, all this bull crap. You hear it. Um, I worked so hard at getting these poems published. It was not by accident. So I submitted to probably, um, if I look back on Submittable, it's set over 700 entries on Submittable, not to mention all the email entries, mm -hmm. uh, all that. So probably around 1,000 to get 20 poems of the 36 in my book published. Uh, and then 12-hour days writing over and over and over again. But, yeah, so I will read um, – God, you know what? I, think I could go for a political poem, the double absidarian. Okay, sure. Um or email to young poet, Rufus Rowlett. Yeah, I'll do uh, two double obsidarians, email to a young poet, and political poem. I'll do email to a young poet first because it kind of goes with what we were just talking about as far as submissions and rejections. So email to a young poet, re-advice, which is a Rilke reference. Um, all right, listen up. First, what you want to do is blend Ritz, bananas, and orange juice together until you get a creamy consistency. Add ghost pepper hot sauce, x lax Diet Pepsi, gunpowder, a glass of gasoline, and a dozen raw eggs for protein. Blend again and enjoy. I call it a Molotov fruit smoothie because, like a Molotov cocktail or fugu, it's liable to kill you. Either way, it'll turn your butthole into a flamethrower the next day when you pass gas. If that sounds gross or dangerous, consider all the other junk people, myself included, ingest. Rubbery burgers from DQ, Kentucky Fried Chicken, all-you-can-eat pancakes at IHOP, Look, the point I'm trying to make with all this mumbo jumbo Molotov talk is that you have to learn to cope with pain, noxious amounts of it, and not temporarily, but ad infinitum. Otherwise, you risk becoming not a poet, but a mental patient who chops off his ear and drowns himself in drink. Quit writing if you can't handle a little gasoline and OJ. Rejection will hurt more. Trust me. It'll feel like a samurai sword sodomizing your ego without lube. Van Gogh took his own life and hurt him so bad. Preferred pushing up daisies to living broken unknown. R.I.P. So punch yourself violently in the nuts. Give a sumo wrestler a piggyback ride. Watch a beauty pageant while guzzling the aforementioned XXX smoothie. Get used to pain to make rejection less tragic. Young poet, good luck. I'd ramble on, but I have a date with a sub-zero walk-in freezer. Naked. I'm trying to contract pneumonia. So yeah, it's, it's painful to, to write, to, to produce, to uh, submit, to get rejected. At all levels, whether just starting out, applying MFA programs, getting rejected. So that's that one. Double absentee. Yeah, yeah. Can we can we talk about that a little bit before we read the next one? Because um, okay. and that's the thing. See, I guess maybe your book is sort of all the things I have anxiety about <laughs> as a publisher, I because I feel awful sending rejection. You know, I mean, you have to do it. Yeah. There's no, you can't just. We talked to you know, we talk about the inflation of of poetry and how many poets there are. There's a lot yeah. of great great poems, and you have to pick, and you have to curate and make it so only a few are the ones that are read. And, um, and so it, the rejection is just such a big part of the game. And every time I send rejection letters, um, which I have to do it like a, a, a thousand at a time, like literally with submittable, it's like, here's the thousand for this week. Bam. And I know that a thousand doesn't people, that feel a little, doesn't that feel a little good though? I'm kidding. No, it actually doesn't. It feels awful. Cause I know a thousand <laughs> people are feeling like crap because of the button yeah. I just clicked. And, and it's just, it's something that I always, um, it's my least favorite part of the job by so far. And I, you know, sometimes I even put off reply, you know, I put off replying longer than I should just because I don't want to have to. And, um, 
and 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 so I don't know. That's just something that everybody has to deal with in this. But is there? I mean, you mentioned that you you submitted a thousand times to get these twenty eight poems published. Um, I don't know. Do you have any any perspective on on how to get through that struggle? Because you you have to. I mean. If you want to write, you have to publish or, or else no one's going to read it. And uh, so how do you yeah. get through that? I mean, and some people are, you know, just post their poems on, um, on online or on Substack or something. And then they have a little necklace, nexus of readers that read. But yeah. um, I don't know. But, but maybe people in the, in the comments can have advice for how to, how to get through the, just the inevitable quality of rejection that's part of poetry. I think... Uh, Dick Westheimer said, uh, any enterprise that includes the three words submit, reject, and accept has inherent problems, which is a perfect way to put it. Um, so I don't know. I, and I also like to try to think of when we accept a poem as like an offer. We offer to publish a poem. I, I try to use that language too, because I'm not like, oh, you're accepted as a human being because this poem you know, worked for me and I think our readers will like it. Um, I know there's just so much. We, the thing is, we never talk about any of this stuff, really, um, honestly. So I don't know. So what do you think about, about that before we read another poem? It depends what your goals are. Um, you mentioned uh, Substat or something like that, you just or vlogs. Some people are perfectly content with that. Instagram poetry uh, or self-publishing. Uh, what's a, it's Milk and Honey, Rupi Cow or whatever her name is. Um, uh, millionaire poet now. <laughs> um it, yeah, it depends what your po- or your goals are. Mine was always to be an academic, to, to eventually teach poetry. It didn't work out, of course. But so I, my goal was to publish with as great as publications as I could. I do think Rattle's a great publication, but to submit to like the most prestigious publications, just wait just to have the patience. And it's grueling because the average is like, what, six months, four months. It's a long process uh, to get those bigger uh, acceptances. Um but if you don't want to do that, that's perfectly fine. Uh, so that's that's it. I, th- I do think it's funny though. Like in my opinion, I mean, Instagram poets are read more widely than poets <laughs> published in like I don't know um, poetry, whatever. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that, and that, that brings up the question of what poetry really, what poetry is, you know, mm-hmm. and, and to me, poetry was always something that pushes the boundaries of your thoughts and, and finds the, the cracks in them and, and, and explores and examines more closely human experience and nature. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and so, and, and so, you know, Instagram poetry tends to be confirming you know, and that's just a completely opposite direction. You know, it's, it's something about sharing an experience that you want to relate, which is very different than exploring and sort of dissecting and finding the nuances in things. So, so nuance is lost um, in those kind of spaces, which, which can be profitable because it, you know, if you, if you're saying something that, that everybody can relate to, then they can everybody. share it and, yeah. and then buy the book and all that's that fine. stuff. So I don't know. I mean, it's another thing that's very complicated when it comes to poems. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's hear, um, the, hear another poem. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess I'll read um, a political poem. Why not? This is uh, one of the reasons he published my poem was uh, the last poem I ever write was because of the sort of political aspect of it. So we can read this one. Um, it's a, it's also a double absidarian. A through Z down the left side, Z through A down the right. It begins with a quote by George Orwell. And that quote is, a few cubicles away, a mild, ineffectual, dreamy creature named Ampleforth, with very hairy ears and a surprising talent for juggling with rhymes and meters, was engaged in producing garbled versions, definitive texts, they were called, of poems which had become ideologically offensive. So the poem uh, is as follows, political poem. A far left progressive purple haired feminist from Uzbekistan who was in my MFA program at Boston University claimed all cops should die. She also worshipped Marx, despised America, and considered herself a militant SJW. Evie, the naive damsel turned terrorist in the movie V for Vendetta, wasn't even as extreme as this BU girl who, by the way, said white people are inherently racist. Huh? I said, and informed her that that was itself racist but she just accused me of attacking her. Judge one another, not according to skin color, nor IQ, King said, I'm paraphrasing, 
but according to important craft like character, whether you uphold freedom, a memo most poets these days seem not to have gotten. Not that there's anything wrong with writing a poem once in a while. It's just that fanatical leftists and the political poetry they produce has hijacked the art and it's all junk. Quash dissident opinions, says the new order. Label Donald J. Rump and anyone flaunting a MAGA hat a Nazi. Suppress free speech that expresses hate speech. To say the left has gone cuckoo would be a misleading understatement. They're a cult that practices self-victimization. Why? Because victims are untouchable, which means you can criticize which means if you criticize them, they can call you a bigoted xenophobe and get you fired. It's as easy as ABC. Yay for love. Yay for inclusivity. Yay for this culturally drab zeitgeist fueled by identity politics and a radical agenda. So, yeah. Okay, so it's a political poem. That's a political poem. From Off Topic. Which is an ironic title because I say I hate political poetry. So I ironically titled it that. Um, and, and yeah, so this was the thing that too that um, has always troubled me. I mean, we we're just talking about all the things that trouble me, but one of the things is that um, there's just, it's, it's a, uh, the poetry world is completely progressive. I mean, it really is. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and it's so progressive. Even if I agree with a lot of that um, on principle, um, yeah. it, the, there's a real problem with having it be a monoculture without other voices to sort of push back and hear different sides of. And I was thinking about doing um, way back when I was kind of naive about all this, maybe 2009 or 2008, I was thinking about doing a conservative poets issue just because there's so few conservative poets. And that's what we always do. We're like, oh, we're not getting submissions from this group of people. Let's have a, a you know, a, a group of poems. You know, let's have a call for submissions for conservative poets. And I asked around for who to interview and who might submit. And nobody wanted to confess to being conservative. And um, yeah, there was, you know, and... Um, and a few people would say, like, oh, I'm not conservative, even though I knew them to be conservative. They would say, um, I'm not conservative. I'm a classical liberal, was what I got. I heard a lot. Um, and and it, there's a sense, even though I'm not sure that it's true, that, you know, it's career. I think you mentioned career suicide by saying you're a conservative. Um, maybe it's a yeah. poem. Um, there's it's definitely a poem. sense that that's there. And the sense um, creates a kind of self-censorship where you don't hear any other voices except for ones, um, you know, especially as poetry gets more political, you don't hear any voices except for from the sort of standard perspective. And so, I don't know, I mean, do you, do you call yourself conservative? It kind of sounds like it through that poem. And do you have a, is it, is it hard to even do that? I used to call myself conservative, but now it's become such a divisive, um, well, all labels have become divisive. I don't want to participate in this uh, um, clown show, this this like football game we mentioned last night. Red team, blue team. I'm red team, you blue team. I know like you, like whatever. Um, also, uh, I mean, obviously, like liberals are a joke to me, but uh, conservatives have let me down greatly. Um, and it's very clear that conservatives in D.C., are just complete hacks and chills. And uh, I don't want to be associated with them either. I haven't watched the news in quite a while. I'm done with it. Um, if I do consider, if I would call myself a conservative poet, like if I had to choose, yeah, I would say that. But uh, it would be just as a way to say I'm not a leftist poet, just because I don't like that movement at all. Uh, so it would just be like a, a, a reaction, a, a label of reaction mm -hmm. rather than a label of just like announcing what I am. Uh, but, um, I'm not really a fan of like attaching myself to my identity to a label, but, um, I, I guess, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you talk about like the Trump era and we probably published, yeah. I don't know. I mean, we might have published 50 or 50 poems about Trump, maybe. Yeah. And we had one poem, you know, in the whole set where we had one poem that sort of empathized with Trump, even though I think it was the harshest criticism of all the poems against Trump because it empathized with his uh, narcissism and, and sort of and really brought to life, which was um, Rachel Custer's poem, How I'm Like Donald Trump. And, it's really good. Um, and, and so just the, the contrast of, of not having any other perspective is a really... I don't know. It's hard to know. You know, it, it sort of renders political poetry meaningless if it all is on coming from the same perspective in a way. Like if if it was a vigorous debate between two sides, it might be interesting. 
Um, but I don't know. Um, you, you mentioned that, I think when we originally published this poem, um, the, the last poem in the book, that you use the um, abecedarian form because nobody could not see the poetry of it or something as you were trying to write on this subject matter. Can you talk a little bit about that, about what it was that drew you to that form, which you have the whole yeah. section, the last third of the book is um, the alphabet city, which um, is in that abacadarian form. So can you talk about why you chose to write poems in that style? Yeah. Um, the first is just fascination and uh, um, playfulness. Um, as difficult as the form as it is, it's it fits my personality, which is wacky and haywire, and my style of poetry very well. Yet at the same time, is able to restrain it from keep. Uh, it's able to keep it from going too far within that very tight corset of a form, uh, bound by both sides, A through Z, Z through A, no exceptions. Um, there was very little of that. There was a very little of those poems in existence. The poems I have read that exist. I don't like, so I I, still, I like that they were written in that form. I think it's cool that the poets did it. I just don't think they're very good. Too often the poets uh, that have written po those poems in that form, um, they just try to meet the form and they sacrifice the poem itself. My goal was to write poems that were so good, no one would ever know that they were in the form. And that's been true. No one has ever known that they were in the form unless I told them ever. Oh, really? And <laughs> yeah, maybe you did. Maybe you did, but uh, no one um before uh mfa teachers no one um and that was awesome to me i also realized toward the end of my writing career uh if you could call it that that uh, i would be quitting soon and that i wanted to finally say what i wanted to say and that if i wrote a poem in free verse people would knock it they would hate on it they could say anything they wanted but if i wrote a poem in a double absidarian form it's untouchable, in my opinion, because you try it, you know, it person who's knocking me like they did on Facebook. And I responded I, with some witty comments like um, it was hilarious. I loved trolling those people. But uh, you try it. You can't do it, can you? Um, so I I wanted to create an airtight. Air, airtight poems uh, that even if someone disagreed with them ideologically, they could not disagree with them artistically. Yeah. And I wanted to do the most anyone had ever written before. And as to my knowledge, I, I've done the most anyone's ever done of well, the form. It was interesting that you quote Denise Duhamel in there, because I always think of that as her her kind of style goes so well with that form. And your voice in here, too, because there's so much energy. You know, it's like a maximalist. So much stuff yeah. comes out and you kind of can't stop. Even I think when you recorded the poem, I think you mentioned like you were out of breath trying to read it for uh, Yeah, for you can website. hear me try and catch my breath. <laughs> yeah. And they're those kind of poems. I just love that energy. So it's a really great form. And um, and you can, really, it's true. Even if you disagree with the politics, you can't say that those aren't really well-crafted poems. Um, and, and it's interesting. So a lot of people in the comments are all saying, um, you know, how much they hate labels and are so tired of labels too. And, and, cool. um, and, and job, there shouldn't guys. be two sides anyway. And you know, Carlton John says there are two sides, especially if you're into flat earth. And and that's really how it is. Like, like, I feel like we're put into these boxes by people who benefit from having this like divisive public in two separate boxes at each other's throats while they're stealing everything behind the scenes. And that's really what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. oh, and so, you know, it's sure. just a divide and conquer strategy. So having uh -huh. these labels, um, but but even you you said something about how you can't stand liberals or something and um, you know, <laughs> yeah I mean even you know I mean, it's just there's no way around it because we live I mean, that's why poetry is so important too is because we live in a world of language and so having these labels that we're sort of bombarded with all the time and the othering that we're always doing with the other side whichever side it is. Um, it, it's just something that is really tearing. I think it's tearing society apart. And then, you know, with the oh, internet, yeah. we have these self-selecting echo chambers. I, I read an essay in 1999 in my only philosophy class in college, actually. It was about the, f it was projecting what the future was going to be like because of, I think it was just because of cable news, but it was because you could select your own um, news to view then the view then that would have to be pushed farther and farther into two extreme sort of dipoles they would eventually be at each other's throats and then the internet comes out and it makes that even worse because you select your friends based on what you you yeah. agree with too and i don't know we got to find a way off of this insanity but i don't know how 
um, I don't know how we're going to do definitely... it. And I hope, you know, I mean, as a publisher and as a, as a editor, I hope that I do a tiny part in, in spreading some, you know, a, a bridge between people who might disagree. Um, but, but it's not easy to do. And, and there aren't a lot of people that are, that are um, reaching across the divide at all. Um, and there sh- shouldn't even be a divide. So anyway, it's very interesting to see these comments here about labels. And, and um, yeah, I think we kind of all feel the same thing. <laughs> So, cool. Yeah, I mean, but but it's hard to divide and conquer. Yeah, it it really is. I mean, and you can even look at something like, um, I mean, this is I try to sort of not voice my own political opinions, but if you look at something about like Occupy Wall Street, they had that um, that they had that narrative of the one percent, which was something we could all get behind, and then and then what happened is that the one percent came in and switched the narrative into different identities and and made us fight amongst each other again because we were about to unify out of the fact that there was the 1% versus the 99%, which is a much better way. That's of... what's happening right now. Yeah. <laughs> right now, there's a gigantic psychological operation or a psyop that this idea that America is racist. Uh, that's a psyop that the elites are using. It's all about the rich versus the poor. That's what it's always been about throughout time. That's what it's about now. It's not about race. It's about wealth disparities. The rich want to stay rich. The poor want to stay, or the, they want to keep the poor poor. Uh, that's, just look what's happening. I'm getting poor, Bezos is getting richer, and they have to divide and conquer us, make us fight, tell uh, the media outlets who they own. I mean, Jeff, Be- it's no coincidence that Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. Mm-hmm. He can put whatever he wants in there to to make sure that people keep in line with the narrative that, you know, America's racist, people are racist, is a huge racist problem in America and stuff like that. All these big time uh, technocratic elites own media outlets that's by design uh uh <laughs> come on people um but yeah i mean even just walking down the sidewalk this morning i went on a walk um the person stepped off the sidewalk 10 feet out went around me because they're so scared of uh omnicron right which is uh, if you rearrange the letters uh spells moronic actually but um They've succeeded in dividing us uh, ideologically and now physically with with the whole um, uh, scare, you know, uh, uh, the the bubonic plague of our time, whatever. Uh, so I can't even say hello to a neighbor who I'm passing. It's a shame. Well, uh, well, let's, we've been talking a lot. Let's hear another poem. We want to make sure we we cover sure. some poems. I think we have about ten minutes maybe let's left. Do, okay, let's do uh, um, the Upper East Side. If you've ever visited, so this is sort of a long poem, but I feel like it's uh, it, it gets to the heart of the book, which is socioeconomics in my view. If you've ever visited New York City, you've probably been to the Met. It's this gigantic archivy museum on the Upper East Side next to Central Park. Six blocks up is the Guggenheim, another famous museum. But I've never been there. It's 25 bucks because that's the thing. The Met's free or nearly. You pay what you want if you live in the city. Each time I've gone, I've only paid a penny. I'm always confused by people who pay more. I'll see them handing over 10, 20, even $100 bills. I'm like, dude, you realize you don't have to do that, right? But the Met depends on people embarrassed to be perceived as not having money, so I guess it balances out. When I first moved to New York in 2017, I actually lived on the Upper East Side, on 72nd Street by the train station with that never-ending escalator in it. I say actually because it's one of the most expensive neighborhoods to live in, and I was so broke I ate tricks with a fork to save milk. Okay, not really, but I was pretty broke. Before moving, I was working as a dishwasher in San Diego and had managed to save up just over 2,000 bucks. That meant I could afford a place that was around 700 a month, enough for first and last plus money for beer until I found a job. So I typed my price range into Craigslist and the next day moved from the hostel in Bushwick I was staying at to the place on the UES. It was August, but there was no AC. The sole window looked out onto a brick wall painted a pigeon shit. The bed it came furnished with was a three inch layer of orange foam. The one bonus was the location. Maybe you don't like ritzy shit, but I do because I've never had it. Walking down the avenues there with bellhops standing outside gilded hotels and ladies in hats walking toy poodles and business owners hosing off sidewalks, which the poodles had pissed on, despite signs that say curb your dog, was like walking through Disneyland to me. It was what I thought of when I thought of New York. Brooklyn? Queens? Psh, give me taxis and corking fees and hydrothermal manholes. Give me suits and suites and selfies in front of the 9-11 memorial. Give me digital propaganda in Times fucking square. Give me the Upper East Side. Whenever I wasn't hungry, 
I get up before the sun crests of the buildings and walk the four blocks over to Central Park. I get a triple espresso at Le Pan Quotidien and sit down on the bench in front of a thick pond and read. I'd imagine Salinger sitting there 70 years earlier observing the great, 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 great grandparents of the ducks I was now observing. In the evening, if I wasn't working or getting sloppy at a bar, to avoid going back to my hovel, I'd take a penny and go to the Met. It's funny because I'm not even a fan of most art. I just liked being there, surrounded by it. When I moved to Williamsburg then, land of the hipsters, it wasn't too long before I began to miss the UES. But I never went back because my job was in Williamsburg. There were plenty of bars to get drunk at there already. Also, because it was getting close to winter, and I'd heard the subway in winter was an incubator for influenza. If I could avoid it, I'd... The trees started blooming, parkas started shedding, the East River started sparkling, sort of. I thought how full of... Cent- I thought... I thought how full of life Central Park must be and remembered my old morning routine. So on a Saturday when I wasn't to sit down on, walk on the dirt track around the reservoir, buy a soft pretzel with salt and mustard on the corner, then go to the Met for a couple hours. And maybe after I grab an IPA at a bar and strike up a conversation with a beautiful woman, I tell her my name was Chad Steele and I was a venture capitalist in town on business. With my itinerary set, I took the L to Union Square and transferred to the 4, which runs like a catheter up the big dick of Manhattan. Right after it got going, though, a shirtless, barefoot homeless dude shuffled in. Having been in the city a while now, I'd seen my fair share of crazy bastards. Not often homeless, either. I went out for a drink with this chick I met at Whole Foods who said she was a gender, non-binary, vegan, cat-living socialist. She talked about shutting down the patriarchy as if it were a slaughterhouse and her disgust with the disparity between the rich and the poor. You live in Soho, I said. You work at Equinox. Your point, she said. But then there's the homeless crazy bastards. Their homelessness is not the reason they're crazy, but their craziness is often the reason they're homeless. So anyway, this dude walks in smearing human shit across the floor like a janitor doing his job in reverse. He would pinched a loaf in the space between the cars and I guess had stepped in it getting up. He hardly seemed to care. He just kept walking, dragging his shitty foot behind him like a zombie. We all sat there and looked at each other and didn't look at each other, praying he wouldn't stop in front of us and ask for a change or a seventh generation baby wipe. Of course, when the train stopped at Grand Central, everyone rushed to leave, stepping over the line at feces and out the doors as other passengers filed in. If you think I thought this was hilarious, I didn't. But what was I supposed to do? Give the crackhead the pin in my pocket so we could go contemplate a Picasso? Virtue signal like that woke Equinox chick, but not really do anything? No thanks. Instead, I got on the next train and went to Central Park Zoo, where I took an iPhone video of seals doing tricks for fish. Yeah, take a breath. That is some poem. Uh, that is the upper east side. Fast. Yeah, take a drink yeah. or something uh, from Off Topic I'll by this. Grant Quackenbush, yeah. Before we go, too, I just want to talk really quickly about the cover. This is the original oil painting uh, painted by Bradford J. Salomon, whose work you should buy, definitely. Here we go. Um, and I'm super stoked on it. Yeah, he's an amazing artist. I could tell you all about that story another time, but how I met him and stuff like that. Yeah, so so what was um? It's an interesting choice to put your own a picture of yourself on the cover, uh, which not many. Yeah, talk about do. narcissistic. <laughs> so uh, so yeah. what was the what was the impetus for that? I'm just gonna keep it here. Um, he paints great portraits. It's mm-hmm. an amazing. I've, I had seen some books with. Uh, uh, the poets on the cover and I thought why not me why not mine the book is very much like you said sort of an artist's journey uh, or Kunst le Roman uh, um, or sort of Bill Doom's Roman and so it's really about me as narcissistic as that sounds and I figured I would do a painting it's sort of a sad looking painting which uh, makes sense given the realization throughout the book that this is um, especially the middle part of the book um, it was, it was mostly that uh, I just wanted a really, really beautiful cover and I was looking for images and I wasn't satisfied with anybody, any of them. And I just wanted to make my own. Yeah. Well, it definitely stands out and, and it's another, it's another, uh, example of the kind of give no Fs, <laughs> you know, kind of perspective yeah. that you have about it, which is interesting and refreshing. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, you were in also our, um, service workers issue. Um, and, yeah. and there's this, it, it kind of has come up a lot in, in separate times in the show, but there's the whole economic barriers to poetry itself, um, which is a problem too. We talked really early on, even in, before you were on about um, submission fees and the problems that those have. Because oh, if yeah. you, you know, if you have a thousand submissions and it's $3 each, that's a lot of money, especially it's if, a lot of money. you know, and if you, um, 
if you you know have a job you know and making a lot of money that's not a big deal maybe over the course of several years but if you're working in the service industry for ten dollars an hour um, that's a real barrier to publishing and then th that goes you know there's all the retreats there's all the workshops <laughs> and and all the um you know festivals and the awp conference that costs a fortune to go to um, yeah. And so there's this whole like networking aspect that's involved in the poetry community that you don't have access to if you don't if you can't afford it. Um, so so Rich and then there's, at the same time, there's this um, sort of fantasy about the starving artist that you mentioned about how, you know, working all day as a waiter or whatever you're doing and then writing all night, like like as if you're not exhausted and still have the time for that. Could you just talk yeah. a little bit about that? Were, were, were the poems in this book written while you were working in the service industry or was it like when you no. had other time? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I am thankful to MFA programs for giving me the time to write. Uh, as crazy as UC Irvine was, I um, I wrote a lot of poems during that time and a lot of poems during Boston University, a ton of poems. I wrote Up East Side during that time. Um, and uh, so, no, they weren't. Very few poems were written while I was uh, going to work at six o'clock in the evening, going bar backing, coming home at four o'clock in the morning, falling asleep at six, seven o'clock in the morning, waking up at two o'clock in the afternoon, getting ready and going to work again, taking the Q train or, whatever, or the J train down to Manhattan again. Very few poems were written. Uh, in fact, I didn't think any during that time. Uh, it's too hard. Charles Bukowski, who is one of my uh, uh, idols for sure, um, talked about that. He's, I mean, that's where, he, that's where I got that starving artist um, uh, commentary from. He said, the myth of the starting artist is a hoax. Is a hoax. Uh, a writer writes much better with a porterhouse steak in his stomach and a, followed by a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. would be true. Yeah. I mean, the thing, um, I, I keep thinking about this, but but David Kirby, you mentioned you like the David Kirby episode. Mm -hmm. You know, cool. and his formula for poetry is like idea plus time equals poem, I think. But if you're working a blue collar job um, or several, you don't have time. And so that's another, there's just so many barriers. Um, you know, you, you think of poetry as all you need is a notebook or something, but that's really no. not the case, you know? You need a room with a view, as Virginia Woolf said. But nowadays, you need, uh, I mean, how are you going to get that room with a view? You know, where I live in Encinitas, a room with a view is like fucking like $3,000 for a room with a view. Where we're supposed to, I'm making a dollar more than minimum wage right now. <laughs> room with a view, okay. Mm -hmm. um right so how are you going to get that exactly that's the question and that's why i am entering law school yay oh, so that's go. <laughs> i'm going to law school uh -huh. um so we'll see i if not this fall the fall after i've done the all set i've applied to all the schools um it, it'll just be a matter of deciding when uh when's the most opportune time to go mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and and the the poetry though you know, even though there are these barriers to sort of participating, it's just such an enriching thing. I just go back to that. And do you do you imagine you know finding time to keep keep writing even as you stay busy um, and and are you know working and trying to to make ends meet? So yeah, I plan on being a lawyer, and and being a lawyer, you're going to have to work ten, twelve hour days. No, I don't plan on writing for quite a long time, but. Like I said previously, when I do begin writing again, if I do, it has to be from a place of abundance. I cannot write. I cannot it, to do so. Otherwise, it'd be irresponsible. It really would. I don't have any family that has money. I mean, they're all dirt poor. I need to take care of the essentials first. Maslow's hierarchy. You know, I need to get that. I need to survive first. Honestly, uh, this is a question a lot of people you know, don't have to think about. If you don't have to think about it, congratulations. You know, you won the lottery as far as being born in America in a rich home. Congratulations to you. But um, no, it'll be quite a long time. Uh, I would like to write again just because it's cool. You know, I, I like to put together a good a good sentence, man. It feels really good. But um, I need to take care of shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, do you, do you feel like in the process of writing this book, like you got something out of it psychologically? Do you feel like you're more, it, it you know, that you learn things and are better, you know, have a better uh, sense of the world through the process of writing the book? Like, did you, do you have non monetary rewards from the process of putting a book together? No, no, <laughs> no, none at all. If, if anything, it's made my perspective about the world worse and, uh, and hampered my growth. <laughs> Interesting. Well, on that fine note, let's read one last poem and, and close out the show. Sure. 
Uh, this poem is called Not the Great Poet. It's a short poem. Uh, Not the Great Poet. One's life is purpose driven, and that purpose is to become a poet, a great poet, a poet who will transcend the art. As one ages, however, and is confronted by reality, one's view of poetry changes. Too niche, no return on investment, dumb. The passion kept hidden like a secret power as a youth seems now unimportant. Fucking seems important. Owning a Tesla seems important. But poetry, poetry does not seem important. Yet from time to time, perhaps out of reason, perhaps drunken emotion, one tells oneself that it is important, the sublime, then sits down and writes what is, regrettably, not. Yeah, that is not the great poet. And once again, from that is not the, the great poet. <laughs> I was once wanting to be the great poet. That is, I am no longer not the great poet, even though this is a great book. And peeps who are listening, you best buy this book, okay? <laughs> it's really good. Um, and you'll love it, I promise. Send me an email if you buy it or something, grantwilliamq at gmail.com. Tell me you like it, whatever. Uh, that'd be really cool. It'd be cool to um, see interaction with the book because that, that makes authors and artists really happy to see interaction with it because I never expected a lot to sell, but if I see some, some sort of interaction, that'd be really cool, even if it's negative interaction. Heck, that's awesome. I don't know if you read my comments on Facebook, but I was completely trolling those this girl who said my poems were like, the poem you published was dumb and stupid and all this stuff. And I completely like dissected what she said. And it was hilarious. Well, thanks for being a guest today and sharing this You're book welcome. with us, Grant. Uh, Thank it's been, you, Tim. It's been interesting. Uh, great talking to you. Yeah, I'll see you later. Okay, cool. Take care. Bye. Bye. So that was uh, Grant Quackenbush with his new book, Off Topic. And uh, here's on screen. You can find the book with this. Uh, it is a sorrowful portrait of Grant on the cover from, um, um, what is it, uh, Pinion Publishing. And that is Pinion-Publishing, uh, Pinion-Publishing.com. And Pinion is P-I-N-Y-O-N-Publishing.com. The book is off topic. And that was our topic for today. I thought it would be an interesting discussion talking to Grant, very different from the, sort of the usual uh, perspectives that we have and talk about on poetry. Martha Deed says she already has it really good. Thanks, Martha. And um, so we're going to take a quick break. We're going to go to open lines, and um, and you can share whatever you would like to share. Um, the the uh, prompt for this week was to write a poem about, I have to find it, the write a poem about a place you've always wanted to visit. Be as specific as you can. That was the prompt for this week. If you have a prompt poem, if you have poems about current events, um, you can share those too. You can share new recently published poems, whatever you'd like to share. Please feel free to do so. The uh, email is openmic at rattle.com. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com. Email the poem to me there. Then I can show it on screen as you read or a link to somewhere if it's published. Then choose one or the other, either Skype. Skype me at rattle poetry, all one word. Just say hi. I'd like to share a poem on the chat message, and I will call you when it is your turn through Skype. Over the phone, it's 818-850-7727. That's 818-850-7727. Just call, let it ring a few times, then hang up, and I will call you back within the hour when it is your turn. And uh, let's take a quick break, stretch, refresh your beverages, and I will be right back.
And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience as we get set up. Uh, one thing I want to share, Grant mentioned his email address if you wanted to email him. And uh, he said it really quickly, though. So it's Grant William Q. Grant William Q at gmail.com if you want to email Grant about his book or anything like that. And uh, let's go to the prop poems for this week. And I said last week that I, one time the prop was write a poem about a place you've always wanted to visit. Be as specific as you can. This is the, the prompt for this week. And my poem, um, I, I said last week that my New Year's resolution was to write real poems instead of like phoning it in every week, um, which I, you know, I, I, I try not to, but I have been a little bit too much lately. I think of a real poem as entering a, a poetic space where you're, it's sort of a spiritual thing almost, where you're surprising yourself a little bit and not knowing where you're going. And uh, so I actually, I did manage, even though it's a short poem, I did enter the poetic space. And my place that I would like to go or had never gone, it reminded me of, um, I had an opportunity to go to Antarctica um, in college for the summer for me, which would have been the winter um, in Antarctica. It was for a research project. And my job would have been to interview people um, about the isolation, both social and like um, sensory, uh, from being over in the uh, cold, freezing 24-hour night in Antarctica. There's only a few hundred people that stay on the continent during the winter there, which is the summer here. And I decided not to go because I was sick of my Rochester, New York winter and didn't want to miss baseball season. And now it's one of the biggest regrets I have because I think it would have been really cool to go, even though I wouldn't have seen the sun for three months. And this is my uh, short Antarctica poem. Antarctica. What hollow songs might the silence make? What howls inside the endless engine of the wind? In the mind's eye, a penguin writes itself over the blackness of the page. But it's winter now. The ink has spilled, the stars scattered on the floor. That is my short poem, Antarctica, for the prompt this week. And here is Megan's poem, also a place that I would love to go. And we're going to have to go here. Uh, this is the Winchester Mystery House. And I've wanted to go to the Winchester Mystery House since I was, um, actually it was my friend Eric Campbell, who you've seen on the show. When I moved across country to California, I was driving across country, and um, Eric, when I talked to him before I left, I think, said, uh, you got to stop at the Winchester Mystery House. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I looked it up, and it's really a cool place. I never did, though. I didn't have time. And then, uh, and then me and Megan have always wanted to go, and we drive past that area in San Jose, California, on our way up to Bend, Oregon for uh, family summer vacations all the time. But we've never stopped either. And and if you don't know, the Winchester Mystery House is um, the the woman's, the fortune of the Winchester rifle. Um, the, the legend is that she um, was sort of haunted by the ghosts of all the people that the rifle had killed. And so she had to build this elaborate maze of a house to keep the ghosts from finding her. She was, you know. Um, and this is Megan's Megan's poem here, and she has a big epigram from WinchesterMysteryHouse.com. The Winchester Mystery House is an architectural wonder and historic landmark in San Jose, California that was once the personal residence of Sarah Lockwood Party Winchester. Tragedy befell Sarah. Her infant daughter died of childhood illness, and a few years later her husband was taken from her by tuberculosis. Shortly after her husband's death, Sarah bought an eight-room farmhouse and began what could only be described as the world's longest home renovation, stopping only when she passed on September 5th, 20, 1922. It's actually a, a hundred years ago now. Um, and here we go. This is the Winchester Mystery House, Megan's poem. When the baby dies, it's the ending and the beginning of every story. What house is big enough to contain an empty crib? When what breaks shatters again, what you build, you build forever. Ten windows become ten thousand, doorknobs multiply like stars, an orchestra of hammers and curses becomes a lullaby. Nothing like the soft song she once sang her daughter. Sometimes at night, if the wind gets quiet, she swears she can hear the walls breathe. And that is the Winchester Mystery House, Megan's poem for this week. Now let's see what you all have. Um, let's see, we have, um, oh goodness, we have uh, Dick Westheimer's here, Jerry Stephenson, uh, Nivy, uh, let's see, Lisa Allison, Mike Bell, Ted Guevara, Patricia Casey, uh, her first time using Skype, we'll get to her. Um, one thing I should mention, um, 
Oh, and Ted Gouver is here on Skype, too, so we'll see if that works. One thing I should mention, that if you call in, no matter which way that we, uh, we talk on the phone, there's a delay. So make sure that you both turn off or mute your stream that you're watching this on now and just talk to me through the phone or Skype. And also have the poem in front of you ready to read because you can't read it off the screen. It won't be at the same time. Um, and you, you know, you'll be like 30 seconds ahead, so it doesn't make any sense. So let's go to our first caller. I think we did Dick Westheimer last last time. Let's do him first this time. And then we'll do Nivi since it's, it's late in India. And then we'll uh, move through from there. Hey, Dick, great to see you. How are you hey, doing Dick. today? Hey, Tim, I'm doing great. Thanks for the interview today. That was a little uh, challenge you gave all of us. And, uh... <laughs> it was. It was a bit of a challenge for me. And um, I hope I don't get canceled just for <laughs> having him on, but we'll see how it goes. Um, well, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting and, and I think important conversation. Not, not that I agreed with everything that Grant said, but I'm really grateful to like engage in that conversation. Yeah, I mean that the thing is that I'm drawn to different opinions. I like to hear them. I like to be challenged and think, you know, and I think uh, I worry about um you know only you know talking to people we agree with is is difficult or for, yeah, well, for as far as your mental development or something like that. I, I I find that for myself if the poet who started the poem agrees with the poet who finished the poem, it's probably not a great poem. Oh, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so, what did you want to share? We have, t- I think, we have two poems that you have, right? Yeah. So, I have my. I, I sent a new draft of my poets respond poem, and I have a, a Nivedita inspired um, uh, prompt poem. If there's time. Excellent. Sure. So, you want to do the PR poem first? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, and it's called uh, "The New Gifts of Epiphany," and just uh, sort of briefly on the process, uh, a friend of mine and I were talking, and I asked him like just like, how do you write a political poem? And he says, I have no idea. It's just they turn out to be political poems. And uh, then he started talking about, um, well, he was thinking about Epiphany, the um, the Catholic celebration of the three kings busting into the manger. And, um, and uh, uh, is always on January 6th. Mm-hmm. And I, I wrote a really bad poem. <laughs> that and then the next day i read that sydney poitier had died mm-hmm. and i started writing about that and then i threw the poems together and this is this yeah. is what resulted and i've been reading um where is it i've been reading the book uh the sort of the the guide of the poet you had on a few weeks ago i dropped the 40 dollars on it oh, Talk- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but i'm interested in his notion of how you, of braiding mm-hmm. so this is my first sort of like after yeah, reading. It's a great technique. So let's see how, how it goes here. Okay. So the new gifts of epiphany. 365 days before Sidney Poitier died, I gaped at the TV screen as white doves swept the air between the camera's lens and the hordes who stormed the Capitol. In churches nearby, the faithful knelt for epiphany praised their three kings who, crowned in gold and garbed in silken robes, shouldered past ragged shepherds, stood above a baby in a manger, bestowed kingly gifts on an infant who wanted nothing more than to nuzzle hungry into his mother's breast. Sidney P., as leading man in this scene, would have spread his arms over that babe, shooed away the kings, and hummed lullabies with the shepherds. In the scene filmed in D.C., he'd have stood before the Capitol, held a mirror to the marauders' garments, asked the MAGA men to consider the lilies of the field, would have then spun stories of real revolution, where blackness became beauty in this land of white-hot shame, where an itinerant carpenter could preach wordless beatitudes to stone throwers. He would then move on from both the crowded barn and the seething streets, sing amen about the sleeping baby, amen about the marching men, amen, 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 sing it over and over and over, even as the song was drowned out by the roaring. And here, a year later, I realized that the doves I saw were not doves. They were gulls, scrounging the scraps the other scavengers left 
Their muse and calls reminded me that after democracy dies, after Sidney P. is forgotten and that his chapel dust, the kings and keepers will still have their perfumes and gold to trade for favors, and the rest of us will have what the gulls leave behind. Yeah, that's a very cool braid. I, I love that braid style. I think it just, you know, bringing things together like that really makes poems really interesting. And so uh, cool to see you working on that form. Yeah, well, some, someday, someday I'll, 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 I'll nail it. Where you know, I love in his poems, and I forget his name now. How they sort of weave, and you That's don't know Kirby again. Yeah, Dave, that you have just left one strand and entered another that you're just sort of taken off guard. So uh, this uh, this um, prompt poem was uh, it 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 is one of these poems that's. Uh, recursively gone back and forth between being a poem and a song lyric and back and forth. And it has suffered because of it. It's sing-songy, you will see, because I extracted it back out of the song lyric for this. But uh, there's a reveal. Leaving Eden. If there is one place I could visit, the one place I'd want to be would be in Eden, Underneath that lovely fruiting apple tree, a naked Eve and a naked me, we'd lounge in luscious reverie and breathe the sweet spring Eden air underneath that apple tree. But life in Eden's so slow and dull. There isn't much to do. There must be more than this easy life. But I can't see it. I don't have a clue. Just wandering round so aimlessly and lazing by the stream, wanting more, but not so sure what, just what more would be. Then a serpent sauntered by with a wily scheme. He winked at me. I winked at him and we began to dream. How can I get out of here? He tells me his grand plan. Call me dumb or insecure. I just didn't understand. He wanted me to walk away to leave Miss Eve behind. I looked at her and back at him. It wasn't hard to decide. Eve was happy on her own, which made me kind of sad. So I walked off with my serpent friend and asked him what he had. He handed me an apple. It was his way to capture me. It was an iPhone 13 plus, fresh from the factory. Life in Eden was so damn boring, now I see it. At last, I've got so much more to do. Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, I can't leave it. And she can't see it. She doesn't have a clue. I was complete with my new phone and social media. I'd no need to explore Eden. I was done with love. Suddenly, the scenery changed. It turned from lush to gray. Then a stage crew bustled in and hauled it all away. And for you believers who blame this mess on Eve, it was me your God told not to do this deed. Oh, excellent. I love the rhymes there, Richard. That was great. And a great, great message, too, from that, that poem, for sure. Thanks, Tim. Good to see you. Yep, always good to see you. Thanks, Richard. Have a Thanks. good Sunday. Thanks for all you do. Bye-bye. Bye. So Richard Westheimer with uh, two poems. The last one was Leaving Eden from the prompt. Okay, we'll do Nivy, and then we'll uh, we'll do some other people. Let's call up Nivy next. Oh. That didn't work. Let me try again. Okay, it's working this time. Good evening, Nivedita. How are you doing today? Hey, Tim. I'm doing great. Thank you. How about you? I'm doing great. Yeah, it's a good morning. Interesting uh, interesting episode this week. Very, quite <laughs> different than usual, but interesting nonetheless. So uh, so what did you have that you would like to share with us? Um, as usual, I have both poems, a prompt, and a news story, but this is a slightly hurriedly written because I flew back from Chennai to Delhi only today, so it was sort of last minute rush to oh, get really? it done. Well, so glad you had a safe travel from from there on the, on the flight. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, uh, let's see, I have the uh, poets respond poem up first. Uh, say it with sheep flock forms. Sir, oh, I saw this. Yeah, this. Uh, say it with sheep flock forms syringe shape in COVID jab push. So explain <laughs> explain this a little bit, and we'll see if I can find a picture. So basically, uh, it's 
Europe has one of the lowest vaccination rates, especially Germany. So there were these couple of farmers who decided to, you know, apparently people love sheep and they think that sheep has a positive effect on people. So they decided to use sheep to send across the message about the importance of getting the COVID vaccine. So they placed breadcrumbs on the ground for where each sheep had to stand. And well, sheep, where one sheep goes, the others follow. So I think they all just followed and made a syringe. And the entire scene was filmed by a drone, which which I think was just something weird and absurd, but something that, well, if it helps people get their vaccine shots, then by all means. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that picture. I was wondering how um, how they got the sheep to do that. So I'm glad, I'm glad for the Bread explanation crumbs. too. Yeah, breadcrumbs would do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never seen that before. I wonder if it's something they do, sheep sheep art. I mean, you could do that for any kind of a symbol or anything. That's kind of cool. <laughs> I just wonder, I mean, okay, the first row of sheep have gone, but then wouldn't they have finished the bread by then? And then why would they still wait there for the others to come? Uh, but might, I think as I, long as they stood. I'd imagine you have to put a lot of bread down <laughs> to keep them eating, you know, like like a wheelbarrow is full of bread. Um, but very interesting. So, so let's hear this poem. Uh, will you or won't you? Will you or won't you? The cases are rising by the day. Omicron is here and ready to play. But hey, let's not get carried away and keep thinking in shades of deepening gray. Let's move away from this depressing note and instead think of something sweet like baby lambs and goats. Now that we're on the topic, I have something to share. At a news like this, you would never have heard, I swear. Like Hansel and Gretel, Remember the duo that followed the trail of bread to lead them back home by showing them the road ahead? Well, that's exactly what we have here, a farmer and his flock showing us the way clear. With breadcrumbs to the farmer arranged his flock of sheep into a shape reminiscent of something we all now see even in our sleep. Even the sheep are telling us we need to get jabbed before the virus causes us all to get entrapped. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. A fun one as always. And then you had another one too. Mm -hmm. So, so this northern is lights the prompt, and yeah. The prompt poem, and it's about this place called Rovaniemi. It's in the Finnish Lapland. I may be butchering the name. I don't know, but it's it's basically the official home of Santa Claus. Like they even have a website, and it it's just one of the most magical places I've ever seen. And I think the northern lights is something, but then seeing it in a place that's called as a winter wonderland is something totally different and when you look at the pictures on the website it's 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 like a scene straight out of a fairy tale for want of a better word i mean so i just wanted to capture that 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 happy more the happy emotions that we feel it's christmas and then you also get to witness the beauty of nature and there's there's, there's literally nothing better than that so this is basically what I imagine the scene would look like, having never been there. But if I go there and if it's like this, I will definitely get back to you and let you know it did live up to the expectations <laughs> that yeah, I well, put well, here. I hope, you, I hope you get to go. Uh, let's hear the poem. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Northern lights in a Christmas wonderland. Aurora Polaris and the signs of nuclear collision with the earth. Uh, never mind. It's magic. Snowflakes and wispy green lights flit through the sky, while inside a thousand sparkling lights, like the iridescent shimmer of butterfly wings, flicker in the perpetual twilight glow. And there's a man in a jolly red suit, trudging through the snow, a smile on his face, while on him trains a glimmering halo of pink and purple. Far beyond in the pastures out back, prance a hundred reindeer munching on wild berries, while the kitchen staff, are they also elves? Keep the hot cocoa and marshmallows coming. This magical Finnish spot resonates with the magic of Christmas, spring and summer and autumn and winter. But don't you think the charm and magic truly come alive when riding a sleigh pulled by reindeer and being gently showered by snowflakes that luminous under the aurora borealis? Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, we saw the photos too. It really does look like a beautiful place. Uh, so hope, hope maybe we can all get to go there sometime. That'd be great. I know, hopefully, hopefully all of us soon will be able to visit something as magical as this. I mean, it's the best of both worlds. Who doesn't love Christmas and who doesn't want to see the Northern Lights? Get yeah, into this one storm. For sure. I've never seen them and um, I'd, I'd love to. Maybe. 
<laughs> well, take care. Always a pleasure talking to you, Nivi. And uh, good thank to you, Tim. It's lovely talking to you. Have a great Sunday. Yep. Bye bye. That was Nivity DeCarthic with two poems, Northern Lights and a Christmas Wonderland, and um, the other one about the sheep. Let's go next to, let's try Patricia Casey. Hey, Patricia, I hear you. And I think uh, if you push the uh, camera button, you'll come in. Okay, I just have to mute you. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Oh. There you come. Oh, let me get you get you resized on the screen here. It's great to see you. I'm so glad you could join us today. And and in a, you called in before, but uh, never never in a on video form. Oh, I've never called in. Oh, you haven't. I thought you did. Maybe I'm thinking of somebody else. So okay. I've never read it. I've never read a poem out loud oh, to wow. anybody. <laughs> well, I'm so glad so, to be the first time for you. So where are you calling from then, first of all? Spencerport, right near where you grew up, Rochester. Ah, yeah, I was in Greece, the next town over is where I actually grew oh, up. Oh, okay, so, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. north of me. Yeah, and my aunt and uncle still live up there in, in Spencerport. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what poem did you want to share? It's called Near Death Experience. And I wrote this when I was having writer's block. And I started looking for words to help me through my writer's block. And this is what came out. Well, excellent. Let's hear it. I have it ready for everybody at home. Go ahead. Okay. Near-death experience. Encapsulating suffocated prose entrapped with an unimagined mind. Faint characters and plot schemes juxtapose incapable of stirring thoughts resigned. Her coffin grips its captivated hold as author hangs on uncreative cross, a jilted magnum opus left untold, creative ebb, a devastating loss. The hodoscope finds enigmatic scenes are mixing up a convoluted mess as thinning plot is scrapped to smithereens. By happenstance, it starts to coalesce. Love's consequential plot extrapolates, imagination's liaison elates. Excellent. Yeah, that was a really cool poem. I love the rhymes again. It's really cool to hear rhyming poetry, which doesn't come in very often. Um, Near-death experience. Thanks so much. I'm so glad you could join us, Patricia. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, have a good day. You too. There's uh, Patricia Casey with Near-Death Experience. And let's go to... Um, Kimberly McNeil, who, um, I, again, I think in my recollection, Kimberly has had poems she's shared before, but never on, on Skype. So we'll see. Hmm. Well, Kimberly's not answering. We'll try again. In a little bit, we'll circle back there. Let's go to Philip Stern. Hello. Hey, Philip. How are you doing today? Good. Let me mute you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So, Hi. Yeah, how are you doing? Uh, good. Good. Uh, my thanks. Okay. May, may have had COVID, we're not sure, but uh, she did test negative, so we're oh. just not sure. But otherwise, things are good. That's good. How's, she, how's your symptoms? Is she feeling okay? Yes, yeah. It, she had something, some sort, maybe it was a flu, who knows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it seems like there's a lot going around, and a lot of it's the Omicron. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, but we, um, you know, we played it with caution, that's all. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way to do it. So you have two short poems, I think, right? I have three haikus. Oh, okay, I only see uh, two, but you can just read the third. I guess I have Rattlecast and End Still. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. I think I sent you the wrong thing, an older version. Okay, well, we can just listen if you want to just read them since they're short. But read them twice since they're haiku. Oh, okay. All right, the first one is, re is in response to the prompt. Um, and I think that it's, you know, pretty self-explanatory. I cannot visit that Milwaukee house, 
the grandson I've never seen virus clogs the air. Mm, that's a great one. Yeah, read it again because it's a haiku. Okay, I cannot visit that Milwaukee house. The grandson I've never seen. Virus clogs the air. Yeah, I like that. Okay, and then the next one. Okay. Uh, the next one is um, something I just wrote last night. and uh, But it's basically, uh, you know, about writing poetry after a rattle cast. That's the title, after a rattle cast. No good strip mining. Deep in the psyche, I scrape at some silver load. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's how I feel. You know, it's uh, you, your sessions really are inspiring. You know, they do prompt uh, better stuff, I think, or at least the attempt to write better stuff. That's, you know, that's what this prompts. Yeah, well, I'm so glad to hear uh, that. That's always the goal. And And what's the third one? Uh, the third one is uh, actually something I keep. Uh, the very first poem I read on Ralph Class a few months ago was in response to the Portman Mateau prompt. Oh yeah, you know, which spoke to me because I, you know, I love wordplay. Uh, but one of those poems, I, I just was never happy with the ending, and I keep trying. <laughs> so this is the latest iteration, and uh, it, it suddenly occurred to me. This can stand on its own as a, uh, uh, you know, as a haiku. Oh, cool. It's called, And Still in Years of Darkness. And Still in Years of Darkness. Poets write glorums. Plabies are born every day when people be belive. Interesting. <laughs> and Still in the Year of Darkness. Very good. Thanks for sharing that, Philip. All right. Thanks for. I'm sorry about send, not sending it to you. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. We have a, sort of a, a different, slightly older version of the and still poem. Uh, but thanks. Right. It's just always a pleasure hearing your voice. Okay. Likewise, Tim. Yep, I take love care and stay stay healthy That's... too. And, and best wishes to your yeah. wife. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. That's Philip Stern with three haiku. Let's go to uh, Lisa Allison next. And she has a link. Let me make sure I can open it first. Okay, let's go to Lisa Allison. She's got two poems here from uh, One Art Poetry. Hey, Lisa, how are you doing today? Hey, good, Tim. How are you? Great. It's great to see you. I don't know if you've ever been on Skype. Weren't you on phone last time, I think? I was. I was on phone last time. Yeah, so it's very cool to see you. I'm glad we could uh, have your face, too. So what do you have that you would like to share with us? Uh, I have got two poems that I sent you that were published in One Art recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have and, it up the link here, and it's oneartpoetry.com. Yes, so that's a publication, because we talked about different publications today and last week. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I think they've got about a 12% acceptance rate, a very, very personable editor, Mark Danowski, I think his name is. Yeah, and so, yeah I've had interactions with him. He's a really good guy. Yeah. Yeah. And so is there anything you want to say about these poems before you read them, or do you want to just jump right um, in? After listening to some of the poems today, I feel like these are slightly co-indulgent in that I was, you know, <laughs> diving into my mood. There's no real wisdom in the poems, but I thought they're two short poems, so I'll share them. Yeah, that's great. Let's go ahead. <clears throat> For cleanup, the soil brown and soft as a fresh grave. I plant Zappaclone in my rock garden, sending it to sleep for two seasons. Press Ativan bulbs three inches deep down the throat of a last foxglove. My thumbs dissolve into dust. Tucking the rake back in the shed, I add instructions on how to breathe. Pour a cold glass of weed killer, dead leaves still clinging to my ankles. Oh, great image in that fall cleanup. And then the other one is corsage. Go ahead with that one too. <clears throat> Corsage. My lover brings me a dandelion on a wire stem, pokes the sharp end through my skin to pin it on my breast. It slips into my body, wraps my false ribs in its long metal roots, spilling its milky juice in my synovial fluid. I want to tell him it hurts to love, but puffballs fall from my mouth, spreading his greedy seed to the world, 
each time I exhale. Oh, I love that too. Both those poems are just full of great images, corsage and uh, fog cleanup. Thanks for sharing both of those, Lisa. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, always a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Okay, that was Lisa Allison once again. And the journal I should mention again was uh, One Art, which I'll put on screen. Oops, here. Come on. There we go. This is One Art, a journal of poetry. And you can find it at oneartpoetry.com. Um, this is the about page. It says, um, uh, One Art aims to publish poetry that adds value to the life of our readers. Um, a poem must not only be good, it must be lasting. Ask yourself what poems you return to again and again. Those are the poems we want to share with the world. And so check that out at uh, oneartpoetry.com. And uh, find Lisa's poems there if you want to read them again. So let's go to, um, let's go to Mike Bales. We usually do Mike Bales toward the end. Let's do him a little earlier. Even though it's kind of late, though, with all the delays on this episode. Hey, Mike, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Uh, what he was talking about, I might be a little bit too tied up to ride. The car's down and it takes a long time to bus to and from work. Oh, yeah, so that would be. For a couple of weeks. Yeah. Well, so, at least the, the bus, does it give you any time to um, read and, and sort of think about poems on the bus? Oh, I I'm I let my mind drift when I was a flagger. I mentally composed a lot of stuff while standing hours along the road. Uh -huh. You know, I... I might see something. So, um, this is out of the Quad Cities. My poems are a virtual journey out of the Quad Cities to France. A friend during college said I went to Europe all around and said I ought to go, but he never quite had the money. Uh -huh. And I figure, I think about it, I figure if I went somewhere, I'd go to France. And this has to do with Hemingway, the expatriates. I remember in reading A Movable Feast, one scene in the book that is pretty neat is when they're all excited when F. Scott's Fitzgerald book got published, The Great Gatsby. That was a neat moment in the book. Friends and I gathered and relived it, like when we did readings in downtown Davenport and we went to a bar, a bar after afterwards as across the alley and I always called it our left bank. Oh, very cool. <laughs> um, this is my movable feast. The epigram is if you were lucky enough to have lived in Paris as a young man, then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays with you. For Paris is a movable feast, and this is my movable feast. It's like three poems in one when I look at it, but I'll read the entire thing. Okay. My movable feast. I want to find myself among poets and writers, artists and lovers on the left side of the Seine. I want to lose myself in the swells of jazz, filling outdoor cafes along the sidewalks. I want to dance with the ghosts of the expatriates as they celebrate poem and verse. I want to drink their wine as if Hemingway, Stein, Pound, and Fitzgerald in their youth still gather, as if a swirl of philosophy still fills the air. What joy. I want to write in a simple place free where passion burns with little to lose. I want to share a heartfelt story as it lives beyond its time and place. Excellent. Me too. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Mike. And that was my movie. Okay. Feast. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Always a pleasure. All right. Bye. Bye. It's Mike Bales with my movable feast. Um, let's call up Ted Guevara. I think Ted has a uh, Skype for the first time. Hey, Ted, how you doing? Hey, Tim. Um, okay. I, can't, I can't see if you want to click the camera button so you can come on camera, but you don't have to if you don't want to either. No, it's okay. Okay, so uh, what did you uh, want to share with us, Ted? It's great to have you on the phone. Yeah, you do. Um, first of all, thank you for all the readings over two months, you know. Yeah, it's, it's always my pleasure. I'm so glad you could share poems regularly. I appreciate it. And this this poem is uh, Chica. Um, yeah, Chica is about Costa Rica. Oh, ah, okay. I've been there twice, you know, like you know, within four years. Oh, yeah? And the first time I went there, I met this 
girl or chica. Uh -huh. And she happens to be a bartender. Oh, cool. I, guess I, I'm so... I went back. I couldn't find her anymore. Uh, well, so, I have it on screen, you... so go ahead and, and read it whenever you're ready, Ted. Okay. Yeah, chica. Chica on three dog plays piano for me. I hear her like a painting. Her fingers move from black keys to white keys. And all the color dance above, like the spewing sound meant to move hips and giggle uniformity. Ah, the pulsating of my love, not with me. Oh, that's beautiful. I love the descriptions there. The fingers moving from black keys to white keys, all the colors dance around. Very great. Thanks for sharing that, Ted. You're welcome. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thanks. That was uh, Ted Govera with Chica from um, the prompt poem this week. And uh, let's go with um, next. Let's call up Spartacus. I think it's getting pretty late over there in the UK, if that's where Spartacus is. Hello. Hey, Spartacus. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, and you, Tim? I'm doing great. It's great to see you. Uh, so what do you have that you would like to share? I've got a poem about Cornwall. Cornwall, And it's called ah. Holidays for Solo Traveler. And I've got some pictures that I think that they are better than the poem. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I have both up. I'll show everybody. I'll, I have the poem. I'll show, uh, I'll show them the picture as you, after you read it. So why don't you go ahead? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Holidays for Solo Traveler. If only I was a solo traveler trapped in the maze of Glendurgan Gardens in Cornwall. Two telephone engineers on ladders would give me directions to find the lost gardens of Heligan. Then I would stay in a guest house in a chatty forest. On the wall of the room, a small anchor would replace a painting, wishing sailors to find their harbor away from storms, in a public sea that is encircled by private land, before I find myself in St. Ives. Excellent. And then here's the poem. This is a Lost Garden of Heligan. And um, oops, let me see. So, uh, oh, wow, look at that photograph. Mm -hmm. That's it. So, yeah, fascinating. So how is that done? Yeah, I did that during summer holidays. Uh -huh. um, so I went almost everywhere in Cornwall. Uh -huh. So I was really impressed with it. Wow. And I just wanted to share these pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is really cool. Thanks for sharing that. And then we have um, the gardens too. The um, Glenda Garden. Oh, wow, look at that. The maze. That is really neat. And then uh, Tintigal. Yeah, beautiful place there. And then the yeah. sculpture at the end, St. Ives. Wow, so many photos. These are really cool. I'm so glad you could share yeah. these, Spartacus. Yeah. Thanks, Tim, for tonight. Yeah, it's always a pleasure and, and great, to, great to see you. Perfect. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. That was Spartacus and Agnostris with uh, his poem, um, Holidays for Solo Traveler. And we do know that Spartacus travels a lot. It's always great to hear where he is. Um, you know, it's always different places, it seems. Um, so good talking to you, Spartacus. Let's try Kimberly McNeil again, see if we can get that to work. And Kimberly has a photo for us as well. Well, the ringer must not be on or something. It says Kimberly's there, but there's no answer. So I'll, I'll just read this um, later. Maybe I'll try one more time. Um, let's see. This is what I'll do. I'll say, let me know if you're back. And then um, I'll try again. If not, I'll just read the poem um, a little later. Who else do we have to call up? Oh, Bev Wendell Atherstone. Let's call up Bev. Hello. Hey, Bev. How are you doing today? Great. How are you? That was a great 
great discussion today. Yeah, it was interesting. Grant. It was sort of a, a, a lively discussion for sure. Um, so, yeah. so what did you want to share with us? I have two poems, one responding to the prompt uh-huh. and one responding to the news. Okay, cool. I think I have a, a dream comes true to see the Taj Mahal, which yeah, must be the, the prompt. prompt. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Is there anything you want to say about it, or do you want to jump right in? I, I think it's kind of explanatory. We lived in India over 50 years ago. Oh, wow, really? And then we had to leave. Mm-hmm. Then we left, and then, then we went back. We've been back a few times. So this tells about my dream. Very cool. My wish. <laughs> A dream comes true to see the Taj Mahal. Crimson hints of sari silks scud across the sky as the day gives way to the moon's caress across a dome firm as a nuptial breast. Her opalescent tomb outshines the full-faced orb. I longed to see this 17th century bejeweled crown, the first and most exquisite Mughal woman's mausoleum of love declared by Emperor Shah Jahan for Mumtaz Mahal, his favorite spouse. After birthing, her 14th child caused her demise. The Shah grieved new life into Mughal architecture, replacing dull, muted hues with white, iridescent marble, creating for his Mumtaz an earthly, translucent paradise. We, standing hand in hand, watched our train depart without us for Agra. I, pale from birthing, too frail for our pilgrimage, was despondent. My husband caught my tears in his promise. We shall return. Twenty years had passed when at last we walked, enchanted, beneath the fluted archways in Agra, dazzled by Mumtaz Mahal's diaphanous tomb, mirrored perfectly in the garden river of and for eternity. In the vaulted arches, we could hear their perfect love reverberating. In the delicate blossoms of lapis lazuli, we could smell her perfume In the inlaid vines of malachite and turquoise, we could watch their lives entwine, while these ancient lovers lie forever in their glowing sarcophagi. Excellent. I love that line. My husband caught my tears in his promise. That's great. And that was, once again, a dream comes true to see the Taj Mahal. Thanks for sharing that, Bev. And then you have another one, too. Yes. And this was in relation to um, the ennui of our times. Uh, yeah, it definitely it's called is. No One Visit. Yeah, so I, I'm pulling up this article, um, The Optimist Daily Guide to Unlanguishing, Ideas on How to Reconnect to Thriving. That was the article you included. you want to explain what this was? Well, this is just about how, <clears throat> how we can um, protect ourselves and bring ourselves out of the languishing ennui of... Uh, constantly staying home and not being in touch with our loved ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's, been, it's almost two years now for the pandemic. It's tough to, it's a long time. It's a very long time. So I caught myself in this space and thought I'd write about it. No one visits. My bra sits in the wash. Unsorted photos wait on the couch. Christmas tree needles are tracked all around the house. The vacuum sits idle. Besides books I have read, outside it's minus 30 degrees Celsius. The wind chill, I dread. I put on my boots, scarf, coat, and my new toque to rake the solar panels of today's snow dump. The cats peer from their warm garage perch. My actions convince them that humans are indeed nuts. Later inside with a hot cup of Earl Grey tea, I'm cozy, surrounded by aromas of my husband's ham hocks and bean stew. 
Yeah, that was a great poem too. No one visits. Thanks, Bev. Uh, where are you? That it's thirty degrees minus thirty degrees Celsius. Uh, Lethbridge, Alberta, and today we're having the Chinook. That's the warm winds coming off the uh, eastern slopes of mm-hmm. the of the Rockies. It was um, this morning. It was. Uh, pardon me. What? This morning it was zero degrees. Oh, wow. and now yeah. it's. And then it went down to minus twenty one again, and now it's going up to plus one. <laughs> well, glad, glad, it's, glad it's warming up a little bit for you. Uh, that sounds very cold, a, Bev. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a roller coaster. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thank you, and stay warm. Bye. Bye. And there's Bev Wendell Atherstone with uh, No One Visits and A Dream Comes True to See the Taj Mahal. Let's see. Do I have anybody else to call? Oh, Jerry Stephenson. Sorry, Jerry. I almost missed you at the very bottom there. And Jerry's got two poems for us. Jim. Hey, Jerry. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm thrilled. Bev Mundell Atherstone is an old friend of mine from Lethbridge. Ah, well, it must be, uh, must be cool good. where you are, too. I think I hear myself in the background. Do you want to mute that? Not anymore. I've extinguished you. Ah, I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. No problem. Yeah, where I am, no, we're uh, we're well plus nine today. I live ah. in the Gulf Islands off uh, the west coast. Ah, but we got a foot and a half of snow. Oh wow, that's a good they amount. They shut the island down. Yeah, they shut it right down. The schools, the stores, everything. <laughs> so, uh, but so, yeah, so I have uh, in Dublin, Fair City, the first poem I have up. Do you want to do that one? Yes. I do. You know, I was thinking where I would go and how I could get there and all this other stuff, and I got overwhelmed uh-huh. because of Molly Malone walking down the aisles and the streets with pushing her cart, right? Uh-huh. So I thought, I'd like to go to Dublin, but open up your imagination. So if you're ready, in Dublin, Fair City, Mr. Peabody, fire up the way back machine. Sherman, attention, please. We'll lunch in Dublin this day. To invite a guest important, that's right. So, Mr. P, logically keen, time is now of the essence, though with you it does not matter. First host, first to be gathered be one-lettered Cohen, as a poet well-known, will put the others at ease, for the location is most common, as where that's once they belonged. Peabody, muddle up the water of time. It's not where we attend, it's the company we bend, elbows to rub, table, round this table, time to be ours, guests are fabled, more than the people, not just the place or the space, Sherman, equations please, alien the poets from similar times, let first rhyme and thoughts fly, clock standing stopped by. Oscar Wilde will lead the charge. James Joyce, and now with Yeats, Catherine Tyne to celebrate. Then from across the Irish Sea, Dylan Thomas to join our company. A toast of fine Irish whiskey. The poets and the place, the quest for me. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that, Jerry. Uh, you know, way to take it one step You're farther right. and move through time as well as space. That is very fun. And, uh, <laughs> Good. And you have another poem, too, Turret House. Yes, I do. We are up in... Uh, Stewart, B.C., right next to Hyder, Alaska. Uh-huh. Our daughter lives there. Huh. And they have all these old houses, and some of them are crumbling down to that. Mm-hmm. Turret House just stole my imagination. I've seen it for several years. It was buried in snow. You just see it peeking out at you. And I just got where we're sitting here. I got, it, I got permission to use the picture, but I don't have it handy to show it. But anyway, so that's going to be for another adventure. Turret House. Whether a lost memory from past life or a haunting yet to receive, Turret House plays with me. Its unexpected present awaits, a mix of metaphors to my soul. Hence, I feel cast in its play. Time set, time lost, timely. Resides in my clock. Reserves me a performance. Resurrects a starring role. Combined with utter terror. I know not its address. I know it lives. I know it has breath. Excellent. That was Turret House. And uh, is that something that yeah. if I look it up, I could find? Or is that something no. that's... Yeah. I gave it the name a couple of years ago. <laughs> okay. It's been abandoned. And, and every time I see it, it just strikes my imagination. So I think I'm going to probably end up doing a series of poems on Stuart and some of these locations. It just blew me away. Very cool. Well, when you do, share a poem and then show us a picture, too. I definitely will. Tim, thank you so much for everything, and all the best of the New Year's to you and all of yours. Yeah, same to you, Jerry, and, uh, and careful with all that snow, too. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Take care now. Bye-bye. It was Jerry Stephenson with a turret house and uh, the other one.
And let's see. Uh, so we have two poems here from uh, Carlton Johnson to read. Now uh, this was, uh, let's see, we have, hopefully I can open this. Let's see. Yeah, I can. So this is just a visit. And I think this is the, this is my poem about going to an unknown destination, says Carlton. And here is uh, Carlton Johnson's poem, Just a Visit. Just a visit. I grab my valise as my knees begin to buckle at the thought of heading to lands undiscovered, unimagined for an undetermined time. The Rand McNally in my library has dozens of dog-eared pages at last, I might reach one of these uncharted, unknown lands. I glance at the Bedecker guidebook to Iceland, find my worn boots, torn jeans, renewed passport, pack of day bag, and book a flight for Reykjavik, leaving tomorrow at 7 a.m., arriving the next gray morning, so in a few days' time, I'll be trekking along the lava flows and see the Nordic glacial snows and cling to slags of rock while spying northern lights. This is the place worth dying for. Iceland waits to be checked off my bucket list, but soon the magic becomes a reality as I insist on living a life uncharted and keeping expectations undefined. Excellent poem. And a lot of people, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, cold weather You'd, you'd think that in the uh, in the middle of the winter here in the north, we would uh, want to imagine going to warm weather places, but we're going cold, and uh, it's beautiful up there for sure. So thanks for sharing that, Carlton. And then you have another poem here too. The other poem is uh, my poetry spawn poem from this week. This is happy anniversary. Um, you can probably imagine what it's about. Let's see, happy anniversary twenty twenty one poetry spawn. Okay, so here is. Carlton's other poem, Happy Anniversary 2021. January is not a month I would have picked for any official occasion, preferring to wait until the thaw of April or May. It was customary, though. Why get married at all? Why not elope on a ski slope or just live in sin? But then what to do with all the new gifts, the new wealth, the new power, if not to establish the bond that ties you to me, to our new house? But you liked it white, virginal, unmarred, unscarred. We had planned for a few loved ones to show up, but we were amazed at the turnout of the horned and horny wanting to get in on with it. My guy and they, those rebel rousers, those roustabouts, those out-of-work worker wannabes, those destroyers of our house, they tramped in, crapped on the floor, broke windows and doors, and stole the rostrum and the wedding cake. Make no mistake, this was supposed to be a happy time, and grand and lesser-known celebratory moment in our history now, just a mystery. How many people, hundreds and hundreds, made it to our house? I guess they googled the address. The small security detail could not hold them back. We all felt personally attacked. The bride was in tears. Who were these people crashing our party? Who were these people making a mess of ceremony? It is hard to imagine that it has been a year since a bunch of so-called patriots attempted to make us fearful to have attendees cower behind closed doors, guns at the ready. We are ready to move on, and yet there is still the stench that lingers like the smell of hate and ignorance wafting from the parquet floors. There's a poached fun poem for uh, Happy Anniversary 2021 by Carlton Johnson. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carlton. Always a pleasure to read yours. Let me see... Um if there is anybody else. Um, let me try Kim Kimberly McNeil one more time. I don't think she's here, though. But we'll try, then I'll read her poems. Okay, well, that's not going to work. But here is uh, The Day Christmas Died. And this is uh, Kimberly McNeil's poem. I'm not sure why we can't connect. It says she's there, so we'll have to figure out what that is. Here we go. This is The Day Christmas Died. I should probably... Actually, hang on one second. It's a little small. Let me... Let me put it in a Word doc so I can actually see it on the screen. Okay, this is going to be better. The Day Christmas Died. Maybe a little bigger, too. Even. There we go. 
the day Christmas died. Garish holiday decorations choked the great room of my brother's large house. Cluttered gifts were stacked high enough to block the windows and form a trail which snaked across the floor. The room's darkness divided by thin beams of afternoon light, which entered through tiny cracks between the stacked and crowded packages. On Christmas morning, the mountains of gifts proved too great a task for my son's spoiled cousins to open, bloated and ungrateful, saturated by stuff they neither needed or wanted. The cousins announced that they were sick of opening presents as they left the room to find new entertainment. The shocking display puzzled my son, who began to protest leaving the brightly wrapped boxes behind. The born and born from this ghastly holiday introduction to gluttony and greed, he quite quickly learned he began to believe that he never had enough, that he needed more, oblivious to his transformation into an entitled bore the day Christmas died. Good Christmas poem there, the day Christmas died from Kimberly McNeil. And let me, uh, let me go to the other poem that Kimberly sent. Um, and this has, here we'll go. We'll paste it in again. Cause it's make sure it's large enough to see. There's a photograph too here. Let's see. There we go. And here's this photo of, um, um, the woods, um, a cabin in the woods. I think this is the place where Kimberly um, imagines going. And it's like the dog that you are is the title of this poem. So let's go ahead. Like the dog that you are. The woods will fill the cabin with snakes. Mother will bring the mud. Your thoughts like spinning tires will trap you in a perpetual, unfinished, plagiarized poem. The cabin, no longer your subterfuge, will betray you with a permanent coldness an ache in your lower back that no fire will warm, pain that will shorten your breaths, causing you to pant like the dog that you are, your breath unnaturally repulsive to birds, deer and bear, who will never visit cabin again. They remember the sadistic head twisting, the way you killed your cat, the mosquitoes you bred will bite your face, serenade your insomnia with an unrelenting buzz in your hairy waxen ears. You will be forced to inhabit the tiny outhouse for shelter. There you will knit putrid strands of fecal mucus, create freshly defecated filigreed dream catchers to stave off the boredom of your pathetic life. Wow, that is some curse. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, Kimberly, uh, not the direction I thought it would go, but there's the, there's the cabin in the woods. Let me show that on screen one more time. Oops, this one. It's the cabin in the woods here that Kimberly was writing about. Thanks for sharing that, Kimberly. And I think that might be it for the show. Let's see. I want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the uh, Saiku really quick. And this week's article that I saw is right here on the screen. This is... um sort of a downer type story a little bit sorry about that but it is an important thing to uh to be in the in the zeitgeist during the discussion and uh this is the article this is from this is from uh where was it um i think it was washington university but i'm not seeing oh george washington university here yeah but so the headline here is nearly two million children worldwide develop asthma as a result of breathing in traffic-related pollution. And so this was the first study to look at how much, um, you know, to, to quantify the effect of um, um, NO2 nitrogen dioxide gas as a pollutant on um, the, the rate of asthma in certain places. So the more, the more of this car exhaust you have, the more asthma you have. And it showed this very clear connection and calculated the amount of excess deaths worldwide. So when we talk about things like climate change, um, you know, this is, uh, the air pollution is a big problem as well that needs to be remembered. And so that is my, my article. And here's the psych who, um, about it. Driving down into the thickening smog I make. Driving down into the thickening smog I make. That is my psych who today. Imagine, you know, I live in the mountains, as we always mention. And um, it's really stark driving down toward L.A., um, you can see 
how much, you know, just this like shroud of brownness, even though it's much better than it used to be, apparently. And um, you see that and you know you're driving through it. You know people are living down there and um, and I'm contributing to it as well. Although my Outback is a, is a partial zero emission vehicle. So um, at least there's that, but there's, you know, partial is a uh, <laughs> is relative term, I think. So that was your Saiku for this week. And your or your uh, prompt for next week is going to be this. Write an echo verse poem by repeating the end syllable of each line, either verbatim or as a rhythm or slant rhyme. Um, Robert Lee Brewer offers excellent examples of this form on the Writer's Digest w- website. So it's an echo verse poem. You repeat the end syllable of each line, either verbatim or as a rhyme or slant rhyme. Um, so it's kind of like an AAAA poem, I believe. We'll look it up and we'll try to do it, an echo verse poem. And that is your prompt for next week. And the guest for next week is going to be uh, Marcella Schulach. Uh, Marcella, remember, was the guest on Rattlecast like 110 or something um, over the summer. And we meant to talk about both her books. She's just prolific. And we meant to talk about both her books and translation. She has a whole bunch of books in translation. And um, and we didn't have time to talk about the translations. So we said we'd have her on back again. And this is the again. We're going to have Marcia Schulich again. She was a great guest. Uh, we're going to talk about all the different poets um, from around the world she's translated and the differences between poetry's sort of feel in different languages, things like that. Should be a really interesting show, especially as we have a tribute to translation um, is the fall issue coming up. And there's a deadline of April 15th for any translators who want to share poems. So that sort of ties in with that a little bit. And that's going to be Rattlecast number 127, Sunday, January 16th at the regular time, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great rest of your Sunday in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye.